Good morning, and welcome to MDIC's Virtual Patient Summit. It's an honor and privilege to have you join us today. I'm Kurt Gunasekran, Director for the Science of Patient Input Program. The Medical Device Innovation Consortium, or MDIC, is a public-private partnership developed to work with government, patients, and industry stakeholders in an effort to advance solutions that promote patient access to innovative medical technologies. While we at MDIC embark on several regulatory science and research initiatives, putting patients first is at the core of our work. In fact, the Science of Patient Input program was developed to advance patient science and engagement in the medical device's total product life cycle. The heart of this initiative is understanding patient needs and creating patient-centric processes and medical technologies that can improve patient access and remove barriers for patients. From my vantage point, there continues to be few areas where the industry as a whole is in its early phase. And of those, there are two areas that need a paradigm shift within the industry. They are one, patient input in the total product life cycle, and two, addressing health equity and disparities in healthcare. This summit aligns with this objective as it aims to bring together collective knowledge, experiences, and best practices in these two important topics. Through thought-provoking presentations and panel discussions, we hope to not only empower patients, but also inspire healthcare and device professionals to understand, learn, and adapt to the needs of their patients. To all of you listening online, due to a packed agenda, we may not have enough time for Q&A, but please feel free to drop them in the chat or in the Q&A window on the screen. While we may not get to all the questions, my project management colleague, Jonna Golder, will be collecting these inputs and we will review them offline to inform our topics and sessions in the future. You're also welcome to email us your comments or feedback at spy at mdic.org. That's spi at mdic.org after the event. We will also drop a copy of the agenda in the chat box in this session. A recording of the session, once approved, will be made available at a later date to those who have registered. As you listen to the, these speakers, I invite you to examine what you can do to help patients, the care continuum, and the medical device development. Explore ways you can add value that shapes the course of patient engagement in product development and commercialization. I also wish to thank our wonderful speakers, patients, caregivers, industry volunteers, and of course, the FDA CDRH speakers for their time sharing their experiences and expertise. We have a lot to accomplish today. So without any further ado, let's go to our first session. Thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. And uh, many thanks to MDIC for inviting me to come and uh, have a chat with the audience gathered here. Um, in Kurt's opening remarks about the importance of patient input, I couldn't agree more. And I look forward to giving you a little bit of a view about the work that my organization, the National Health Council, does on that topic. So I will go ahead and patients with chronic um, conditions in the United States and work together to collectivize that voice to forge patient-centered health policy. We do that in a myriad of ways and find it to be critically important. Um, we convene over 160 um, health-related groups, both um, in the for-profit and nonprofit sector, to really get those varying and diverse perspectives to figure out where the common ground is and continually advance the cause of patients in the health system so that the care that's available and they receive and that is affordable reflects what they want and what they need. 
This slide shows you just a little bit about the, the depth and breadth of the conditions and stakeholders that we represent at the National Health Council, um, from small rare disease groups to large um, powerhouse patient organizations like the American Heart Association. All of those folks have a home um, under our big tent. Um, that is um, the patient-oriented part of our membership, but we also have um, industry both on the medical device side and the pharmaceutical side, payers, all these different actors who have um, to, to find that, that overlap where we all um, can work together to improve the lives of patients. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about areas of expertise at the National Health Council and some things that are really relevant to your broader discussion at this event today. Uh, patient engagement, something that we have a, a real depth of, of knowledge and experience on, and I'll share some tools with you that we use um, to that end. I'll talk to you about our fair market value calculator, which is a very practical, tangible um, a tool that can be used that has a, a big impact um, for how you do the work that you do and represent patients in that process. And then I'll end with uh, a few best practices and things to avoid. Um, really common sense things that um, that if we all were doing them would make a big difference. Um, so common sense that it's sometimes um, surprising that we're not all doing them. So uh, first on this next slide, I'm going to bring up a video. And so um, this is a short clip, I promise. Um, and it is from an event that we do every year called the Science of Patient Engagement Symposium. And really that event convenes research leaders to share their experience, accomplishments, best practices, uh, resulting from translational impacts on the science of patient engagement. So this event happened this year in May and the theme was patient empowerment in the digital health era. The clip is from a panel um, called Enhancing Patient Engagement in Medical Device Development. And the woman that you'll hear speaking is um, a patient advocate by the name of Sharice Shockley. So I'm gonna go ahead and play that and um, then I'll talk a little bit about it on the other side. The next person real quick is Dr. Felissa DeRose who's from Florida. She travels around the country, actually around the world talking about diabetes. She's a black woman. And she has had a seat at every table. She's shared her experience, but she's never been asked to participate in the design of an insulin pump. She said, I was asked to comment afterwards once, but she felt like it was a check in the box because they needed to ap uh, apply something, but they never took the group's recommendations or suggestions when the pump came to market. And I wanna highlight something here. She's also a good friend who, um, she's lived down south, she's lived in Dubai, everywhere. But she's freaked out because the color of her insulin pump is black. And her main concern is, I am a black woman, and if I was in a situation with the police, and if I had to reach for my insulin pump, what could happen? Because my pump is black. They can assume that I'm reaching for a weapon, but my pump is black. Why do people only make insulin pumps in black? So I can tell you that this panel uh, was quite powerful. But when Ms. Shockley shared this particular anecdote, the, the feeling in the room changed because it puts such a laser focus point on why patient engagement in the processes that we all work in is so important. And not just patient engagement, but meaningful patient engagement. It's, I'm sure that all of you are thinking, well, gosh, there's probably, it probably isn't that big of a deal to change the color of an insulin pump. But if you never really talk to the people who are on the far side of using that technology and, and it is life-saving for them, to understand something like the color of it and how that might affect different people differently is, is a powerful crystallization of why it matters to build in patient engagement well and to build it in from the beginning. So here's a definition. That there's a, one of the problems I think in this space is that there's a million definitions and there's not a lot of shadow between them, but people can get caught up talking about words and wordsmithing. And so 
you're all very capable people and can read this definition, but I really want to point you to these um, words that I've highlighted in red here, bold, meaningful, collaborative, decision-making, and partners. I think if we could all agree that those words matter and we keep them front of mind as we consider and design for patient engagement and patient involvement in the processes that we work on, we would all be really moving the ball forward. So I just want to focus you on those words that if you can sort of tick the box on those things in processes that you're involved in, you, you're probably ahead of the game. Just to paint a little bit of a picture, what this um, slide does is in the on the public side, we've done a, sort of a landscape analysis to see where are the places that patient engagement, patient representation is required on different sort of advisory bodies and, and different decision-making venues within our public institutions. And I think that you'll see here is that there's a really broad diversity of, um, of where it's built in and so what that does in terms of the reflection of the outputs. For example, you'll see the Food and Drug Administration here has um, 51 places within the work that they do that it, it is required that they engage patients in the work and the process. Now there's a lot of variability in terms of what that really means, but you have to have it built in to, to start with, like that's the first step. And, and by comparison or, or by contrast, really, you can see Centers for Medicaid, uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services um, has only five places where patient representation is required. Millions of people, um, their care is determined through the work that CMS does, but there is not a lot of patient representation required of those systems and structures. So this is really the environment that we're working in. Obviously, on the private side, there's even, you know, you could go deeper there. This is more publicly available information and really just serves to, to make us think about, you know, how many decisions are being made, probably with a lot less patient representation that, that we would want or that could meaningfully contribute to the outcomes and outputs. So now I want to talk to you about a tool that we developed several years ago called patient experience mapping. Um, and if you'll forgive me, I might blow through this a little bit quicker than I originally intended because I found this morning that um, I go longer than I planned. So um, always happy to take questions on any of this after um, if uh, anyone is interested in that. So patient experience mapping, which we sort of shorthand as PEMT, um, has the, the objective. What we did was we developed this to help researchers have a really consistent, holistic, systematic way to, um, to get at patient experience. And we very purposely changed it from um, patient journey because journey sort of implies that a, a, a linear process that has a beginning and an end. And the patient experience is really, it's a lifelong <laughs> thing. It doesn't have within that um, sort of stop and end points uh, for those living with chronic conditions. And really the experience shifts and changes over the course of, um, of a, a, a disease or condition. And so it, it was really incorporating patients and reflecting their experience that had us change that name. So it's really, I'll be just pointing out all these little ways that having patients involved really shapes what we're doing. So the um, toolbox itself, it has project planning tools to sort of, you know, at that front side when you're getting ready and thinking about how to how to do something like um, engaging in, in a patient experience mapping, and then all of the data collection tools that you use um, for um, actually conducting the interviews, gathering the data, um, getting consent, all that kind of stuff. Um, here's just a little snapshot of our website. Um, so you can see that there is, there's a, there's a whole host of tools available here that, um, provided that researchers can use to really ramp up and develop, um, a program that allows them to get deeper into the understanding of what a patient experience is, um, with any variety of chronic conditions. It is disease agnostic, so it can be applied in all different sort of settings and, and disease conditions. And, um, uh, it can be lifted up and used um, by folks independent of us, but we also do partner with, um, with public and private actors to conduct these studies and um, 
and give light and voice to the patient experience. Here's an example of how um, sort of really keeping the patient in mind makes a difference. On the left, you'll see um, what initially was our uh, consent form, and then on the right, what we changed it to based on patient feedback. Um, the language change, the format, the bullet, the way that we bulleted things, the way that we presented information, and uh, really what this, it, it made it much more health literate for, um, for a general patient audience. It's very easy to get caught up in scientific terms that um, if you're only talking to other people who understand you, you don't even notice it. But when you're sort of taking that work on the road and engaging with um, a broad spectrum of individuals who have a variety of um, information and education around the terms, it's really important to build that in so that um, from that initial engagement, you have that it, it helps create the buy-in and and the feeling of respect and that uh, that the patient experience is really wanted. Um, this is a visual that we use for um, interviewers who are um, who are talking to patients and getting more information about their experience, and it's really it it was designed um, with patients to um, really represent what is typical of a patient experience. There's all of the things that was before the diagnosis, um, which helps really expose like the feelings of loss and change that people, when they when the onset of symptoms begins and the, the stress that comes with not knowing what's going on and often a, a fairly circuitous route to, to finding a diagnosis and finding a treatment that works. So, these are purposely split into islands because they are bridges and the experience sort of evolves and changes as you travel through. And it's not linear. Sometimes you end up back at the beginning, crossing these bridges more than once, uh, changing diagnosis, changing um, interventions, therapies that um, apply in the condition. Sometimes one condition leads to another. All of those things are captured through this sort of dynamic picture and really allows researchers, interviewers, to, um, to build rapport with patients and, um, and solicit the kind of information that really makes um, the understanding on the research side much more informed and much more robust. We also have the interview guide. And um, this quote, I, I wanna read this quote here from an epilepsy patient that we worked with in this process. You know, she told us that she didn't wanna go to sleep because that's when the seizures would happen. And didn't really, she didn't really worry about it in school, the the seizures, until she saw another student have one, uh, and that would scared her because she would think, "What if that happens to me in that setting?" But usually, I just didn't want to go to sleep. It was almost like, you know, if I go to sleep, that's I will have I'll have these symptoms that are really devastating for me in my life. And so we uh, we changed in the interview guide and added, um, "Were there things you did to avoid triggering your condition, whether they were." accurate or useful or not, or you know, kind of going at some of like the mental health components of this. Sometimes we get stuck in asking the what's there, but asking what's not there, what did you avoid? What did you change? What did you do differently? Is just as important to get information on. So by involving patients in our development of these tools, we are able to really develop something that was much more reflective of, of the, the depth and breadth of experience and bringing that kind of information forward. So I'm gonna quick talk about another tool that we have called patient-centered core impact sets, which I will tell you, I um, very much would like to change the name of because I feel like it's doesn't roll off the tongue. But um, it is a really powerful tool that we are right now piloting in the Crohn's and colitis space. And so the idea here is to get a prioritized list of impacts of the disease um, and or its treatments that they have on the patient and their life, as well as their family um, and caregivers. And so the idea here is that if you really have a thoughtful, fully engaged representative set of data about what, what matters the most to patients, that on the patient group side, on the stakeholder, the patient stakeholder side, you can describe the disease in much richer detail um, and much more accurate in terms of the patient experience. And that can be useful in so many settings. And on the researcher side, having that sort of data set available can be 
incredibly instructive in terms of your research pathways and what to consider, what to um, look for, and what to avoid. So, um, so PCCIS, see, I told you it doesn't roll off the tongue, um, is can be used in clinical trials, real world studies, regulatory decisions, value assessment, economic model, like it's so broadly applicable. And so, like I said, we're, we're piloting in the um, Crohn's and colitis space right now, which should be really interesting to see where we can go. This is a really complicated graphic that, <laughs> um, that kind of explains why PCCIS and how we do that. So we start with this really um, a big pool and then through the input of patients and caregivers help narrow down and then prioritize what are the most important things to patients and caregivers about the reality of living with the um, disease and and the um, it, it, it focus much more on the now that you have the diagnosis now that you're in treatment what um, what does that do to how you live your life so that it's really focused on that side of the patient experience and not so much on the early diagnosis finding treatment side. Um, it really allows you to dig down there and it it really, we're seeing it lift up such important information that helps in, in a wide variety of ways. Again, this is a little bit of what you will find um, on our website. Um, if you are interested in looking into more of this kind of a tool, we have a blueprint and um, it, just a whole robust set of things that can help you go sort of down the path into looking at, at this kind of a tool and what applicability it may have for work that you do. Um, next, I wanted to talk a little bit about our fair market value calculator. This is incredibly practical and easy to use and, um, and is a great sort of early thing that you can do if you're engaging patients and processes that you're doing. Um, if you really want to signal that you value and respect um, the expertise and experience that they bring to the table, um, using a fair market value calculator is a is a critically important way to uh, to start off. And so, um, our fair market value calculator was developed in collaboration with partners in Europe. I mean, many of the industry side folks that we work with. Um, uh, are global in nature, and there's so much work going on in the patient engagement space across um, Western countries. We do, uh, even though our work is focused on a U.S.-based population, we collaborate internationally because there's value at, um, at these sort of concepts pulling across, especially because so many of the actors um, uh, on the for-profit side are um, global in nature. So just to, to give you that sense of, of how we do this kind of work. So why did we create this? I mean, feedback really is that there was not a sort of external, neutral, validated way to, um, to figure out how, um, how to value patient experience and build it in for sort of like compensation um, in the work that we that we all do and that we want to do to have patients involved. You know, I mean, 20, 30 years ago, there was really no thought about the fact that, you know, asking um, patients to give, you know, to go through uncomfortable things in mysterious processes and um, and give their time um, and and perspective, um, there, there was not a lot about um, how to value that and how to make sure that that, that was done in a respectful way. So um, this was really reflective of of the need to to put that out there and and give it the um, that it wasn't just that this this group and that group and the other group all does it their own way, trying to lift it above the fold a little bit so that um, there could be more consistency and defensibility about how um, folks were doing things. So this shows you um, sort of the iterative process that we went through to develop the calculator and, um, and you know, anything that ends up easy to use and simple has a whole lot sort of underneath the surface of scurrying around um, to make sure that it's of really good quality. And so, you know, we have steering committee um, involved in it, um, 
comparing and reconciling the market rates from our member organizations, lots of interviews to get that input into it, the compensation data that sort of like is on the backside that drives the calculations. This came out, this um, calculator came out in, um, I believe it was 2016. And so we're in the process now of um, updating the economic data that is on the backside of it to drive it because so many economic circumstances have changed since it first came out. Um, and we're looking to get on a more regular cycle for those updates so that it's always um, current and reflects um, the conditions on the ground. But um, this is just to to let you know that there's um, if you if you go check it out, it, it looks simple, but there's a lot in the background to make it happen. Um, so what's going on to sort of drive the hourly rates that come out of our fair market value calculator? Um, talks a little bit here on this slide about the different things that went into the, determining the patient activities. What is it that patients are doing with um, with companies, with public bodies to, um, you know, are they on panels? Are they in, um, are they doing interviews? Are there um, all those different activities that they may be involved in? And they're not all sort of maybe compensated the same either because the, um, the physical or the emotional intensity of them, the um, the level of knowledge, experience, and expertise that um, may make a patient qualified to interact in this way. So it takes into account all of those different dynamics. And then the work that went on to, to kind of come up with appropriate benchmarking, because, um, you know, it's not like you can just sort of pluck that out, like what is the value, you know, what do you compare a patient's experience to, to make sure that you're setting uh, rates at the right level. And so there we did a lot of work to figure out how to align that to what kind of um, what kind of other roles, and and like I said, it goes a lot to what is the nature of the activities that patients may be asked to engage in, and and what is necessary for them to have in order for that to be a good match. So what happens when you use the fair market value calculator is that the patient is really considered an independent consultant and you ask, I mean, I'm sorry, you answer a bunch of questions related to what it is you'll be asking patients to do, maybe how many patients or um, all those different kind of variables. And it produces for you an hourly rate. So if you're going to have five patients participate in a two hour focus group, and you've created that sort of profile of what you're looking for in terms of having patients in that group, this will give you an hourly rate for what you should expect to build into your budget to be able to compensate patients fairly for the expertise that they provide. So lots of different uses here, um, but I'm sorry, I can't see my own slide. Um, like I said, there just wasn't anywhere that external that um, that folks could find to do this. And what we hear back from stakeholders is um, I can't go out to a meeting where I don't meet new people where I hear that they're using our fair market value calculator um, <clears throat> um, or have, you know, sort of taken it and are, um, and are riffing on it in, in different ways that um, that they're doing the work internally at their own organizations. Um, it's it's probably our most used and most um, valued um, tool that we provide for um, for really getting into the nitty gritty of making sure that uh, the value of patients is considered and the respect that patients deserve in coming forward with some of the most difficult personal, emotional, physical um, contributions that they make for the betterment of, of themselves and others who live with similar conditions. This really gives guidelines and framework and has the, um, the it, I think it's really valuable on the other side because lots and lots of different actors in the space use it so that it's not any one company or any one organization sort of pushing out and saying, this is what it is. We, um, by us taking that on, it gives that opportunity to other organizations to rely on a more neutral party. And we um, get a lot of positive feedback that it's helpful in that way. I think I am coming up on time. So I'm just gonna quickly move on to 
these best practices. So um, I think you've heard me talk about these things already this morning, but things to do is include patients from the very beginning. Don't wait until it doesn't really matter that they're there, except from a PR perspective, really get them involved early. Um, value the expertise of, of patients comparably to other experts. Um, patients are experts on their own experience and their own conditions, and, and that is really um, worthy of um, your attention, just like any other kind of uh, expertise that you might involve in a process that you're involved in. Um, value caregiver expertise as different from and not a replacement for patient expertise. Um, both are really important, and the fair market value actually um, allows you to, to look at, at caregiver compensation models as well, um, but, but make sure to understand and differentiate there. Um, continue the information that we hear a lot from patients that they participated in something and then they never heard anything again. They didn't know what their contribution meant, what happened with the project or the process they were involved in. It's a really simple thing. Keep keep the communication going. Patients are really curious to know um, what happens as a result of the fact that they give their time and energy to, um, to try and advance work in an area that matters so very much to them. Um, things not to do, um, don't assume what's most important to a patient. That's something that has to be um, looked at uh, from in, in a from a research perspective, we don't know what's most important to a patient unless we um, go to considerable effort to make sure that we ask in a way that gives us representative sample and helps us understand. Um, and not all patients are the same, so we need to reckon with that. Uh, invite patient engagement when it's too late. Don't do that. I'm, I think patients. I mean, in the in the clip I showed at the beginning is um, you know the Sheree Shockley was talking about how her friend um, involved in so many things, but always brought in at the end when everything was sort of baked and cooked and really just looking for a blessing. That's not respectful of patients and that's not meaningful patient engagement. Um, don't use language that isolates patients from fully participating. Nobody wants to sit down at a table and have everybody throwing around big words and acronyms um, and then be asked what they think. People, you know, that really has a chilling effect on the contributions. So, so be thoughtful about the language and prepare to engage all of the people in a process, not just the, maybe the, the science folks who have a, a different vocabulary. Um, and never ask a single patient to represent an entire um, patient population. Um, patient experience is variable and different, even with the same condition, whether that be cultural, emotional, um, how long they've had a condition, what their diagnosis journey has been. There's so many factors. So make sure that you take that into account when you um, consider what you can derive from a single patient's experience or how many patients you may need to involve to have something more representative. Whew. I will stop there. Thank you all very much. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Um, my name is Amy Mayer um, and I am excited to be leading the next portion of our program this morning as part of MDIC's annual patient forum. Um, my name is Amy Dudzinski Mayer um, and by day um, I'm a senior leader at a biopharma software startup focused on the delivery of modern technology to support modern science. Um, and really my daytime goal um, at that company, which is called Benchling, um, is that um, you know, technology can help drive acceleration with getting research candidates to patients more quickly, um, we will figure out a way. Um, I have worked um, in the life sciences, uh, biotechnology and software space, as well as medical device software space for well over the past 25 years primarily focused on clinical trials and data management to help patients. But first, I'm going to start with a story um, and my connection uh, to today's event. Uh, so as I said, I've been working in this industry for a very long time. Uh, but back in 2014, um, I was out rowing. Uh, I row competitively here in Boston um, and just wasn't feeling uh, right under my left arm. Um, and um, multiple uh, doctors and specialist visits um, eventually led to uh, a number of tests. Um, and it was determined that I just had a, had a pulled lat muscle. Uh, I was sent for some physical therapy and sent on my way. 
Uh, but the next following year, um, I happened to be due uh, for some follow-up testing. Um, I remember asking my husband, because we had just returned from a wonderful family vacation to Disney World, if I needed to have this follow-up testing. Um, and he's like, you know, you're in the system, you might as well follow up with the testing. Um, and lo and behold, um, in going for that testing, I uh, learned at the age of 36 uh, that I had breast cancer. Um, I had no family history. Um, I was an athlete. Um, I ate really well, um, took very good care of myself, um, but was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 36. Uh, being a 36-year-old diagnosed with breast cancer, you don't meet a lot of other 30-year-olds uh, 30, 30 that have breast cancer. Um, and so it was a very scary experience as a patient uh, for the very first time in my life. Um, I was fortunate enough um, because I had a two-year-old son at the time to have my mom come to Boston. She helped take care of my family. Um, and I was eventually able to get back to work in the fall of 2014 and actually compete 12 weeks after my surgery and the head of the Charles Regatta, which was a very, very big milestone for me. Um, my mom actually returned to upstate New York after the taking care of me. Um, and uh, we had learned actually through a 3D mammogram that my breast cancer had actually been discovered very early. Um, and what ended up happening just several weeks later um, was that my mom, who had never missed a mammogram one day in her life, um, got diagnosed with breast cancer um, within six months of myself and ended up back here in Boston going through a very similar surgery. Uh, so within a six month period of time, um, I went from just being a mom and an athlete to becoming a patient and becoming a caregiver. Um, and really from that day, um, really became a patient advocate for other women um, affected by breast cancer. Um, I continued on, uh, but in 2019, started to feel really weird uh, rowing. Um, my balance was off, I wasn't feeling right. And lo and behold, um, I would go on to be diagnosed uh, with a serious brain tumor um, that was fused to my brain stem. Um, and following well over a 20 hour surgery, um, in November of 2019, um, um, I would come out of that um, and, and essentially survive a very serious, very serious condition um, and be essentially reliant on uh, a device uh, for the rest of my life. I tell this story uh, because obviously I started out my career, ended up in the software space, never imagined that I would ever become uh, part of this whole ecosystem as a patient or a caregiver. Um, but here I am, I'm a patient, I'm a caregiver, I've devoted my entire career to the life sciences, biotech, and medical device industry, and now today I live dependent on medical devices in my own body. Uh, my coping mechanism and why I am here today um, has been to really share my story. Um, and if you Google my name, uh, you'll probably find a few videos about me um, that will probably um, more uh, vividly depict the story. Um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more. Um, today, I am delighted to partner with MDIC um, to spend the next hour or so exploring topics with three other wonderful individuals um, that I have really been excited to learn more about as part of preparing for today. Um, and I look forward next to welcoming our panelists um, as we move forward with the program. Um, so Mary Jo, um, I'd like to welcome you this morning. Um, I was thrilled to spend some time with you and get to know you a little bit better. Um, obviously, I know you've been very successful in your career. Um, you've been a caregiver. Um, I just want to welcome you to the panel today um, and was hopeful if you could talk a little bit about um, your background and, and what you bring to today's discussion. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for telling your story. It's uh... I'm I'm uh, I'm very touched by hearing your story, and uh, I appreciate that. And my thanks to Kurt and to the MDIC folks for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all today. So, in sharing my my journey, um, I will start with with where it started. Um, it began in 1979 when my youngest sister Karen, at the age of 17, suffered sudden cardiac arrest due to an inherited heart rhythm disorder that prior to this, we did not know she had. Um, she, uh, during that cardiac arrest, was not resuscitated early enough to uh, save her, her brain tissue. She suffered profound brain injury and to this day requires 24-7 care. She is alive and uh, 
uh, but otherwise requires that care. Um, I have become her caregiver at this point in my life. Um, it's it's an honor to take care of her. Um, but that whole experience left us with questions, um, grief and questions. How could this happen to an otherwise very healthy young woman? Um, and so that was that was what propelled me into my career in the medical device industry. I should tell you that because she survived and we were able to, the doctors were able to see an EKG of her heart rhythm, it was determined that she had something called long QT syndrome, which causes sudden death, can cause sudden death in children, teens, and young adults. And the rest of us were all tested. At the time, we only had EKGs to test, but later on, we were able to get genetic testing as well to confirm that several of us in the family also have long QT syndrome, including myself. Another one of my sisters suffered cardiac arrest two years later and was successfully resuscitated at the time. So um, this is what propelled me into the industry. I have uh, had, the, had the opportunity to help develop a number of different technologies for resuscitation as well as ECG systems both so diagnostics as well as therapeutics for interventional cardiology and electrophysiology. Um, what happened to Karen shouldn't have happened to anyone and it, it, it should not happen to any family. So that has been my journey, my quest all these years is to uh, help people, help families. I've had the opportunity to work for a number of large multinational companies, but also have directed two startups in the medical device space. Uh, my 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 greatest honor, my uh, most rewarding position was with an organization called uh, Cardiac Arrhythmias Research and Education, and we were a national patient advocacy organization that supports patients and families who have inherited heart rhythm disorders like my family. And we were able to help a number of families and patients navigate the healthcare system and, and tease out um, these otherwise fairly rare disorders. Um, uh, in 2007, after all these years of, of being the advocate and being the product developer, 2007, I became patient. I suffered cardiac arrest myself and thankfully was immediately resuscitated. I am now on my second implanted cardioverter defibrillator ICD that helps me stay alive. And uh, I'm most grateful for that. I'm I also serve on Boston Scientific's Patient Safety Advisory Board. We're a group of independent experts in all areas of, of uh, patient advocacy, cardiology, electrophysiology, ethics, and we help to advise the company independently uh, about the right things to do for patients, specifically for patient safety. So again, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you, and I look forward to hearing the stories of the rest of my panelists. Well, thank you, Mary Jo. Um, and I can hear in your voice, you know, how dedicated you are to your family and dedicated to this industry, um, as well as obviously, you know, you've been personally affected. And obviously, we have something in common and that, you know, we're tied to the device industry for life. Um, and I think we'll, we'll learn through the rest of the stories today and what we hear from the other panelists. You know, we, we all have a lot in common. And I just want to thank you for um, your grit and authenticity today um, and, and contributing to our discussion. Um, I would like to uh, welcome Heather Hodges to our panel. Um, as a mother myself, um, I know the job very well that you have um, and the love and devotion we have to our children. Um, and in addition to mother, I know you also play the role of caregiver. Uh, so I would love uh, for you to introduce yourself to everyone. I think you might be on mute, Heather. Okay, can you hear me now? I okay. can, I can, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I am mom to Lila, who is six years old. She was born with a very rare genetic brain disorder. There are only like 400 cases worldwide of her specific disorder. Um, and it was after a very healthy pregnancy, you know, they 
told us nothing was wrong. Um, and at five months old, she was shunted for hydrocephalus, uh, which was devastating to us because the uh, fail rates are so great in a uh, shunt. Um, and then not long after she was shunted, um, she started having seizures and they attributed it to a brain malformation that she has. Um, and on her eighth seizure, our local fire department came and convinced us to just go get checked out at our local children's hospital. You know, I still remember the fireman said, if this was my baby and it's a Sunday, it's going to be slow in the ER, you'll get in and you'll get out. Um, so we took the ride and um, we weren't, we didn't leave the hospital for 28 days because she was diagnosed with severely low blood sugar. Um, when we got to the ER, her sugar was 18, which if you know anything about blood sugar, it should be well over 80. Um, and so that started, you know, the hydrocephalus was devastating enough, but the blood sugar was her body like actively trying to kill her basically so that's where my advocacy for her really started um you know we were admitted transferred down to our our the base hospital and um for 28 days we just tried to figure out how we could keep our little you know at that point she was seven months old how we could keep our seven month old baby alive um and we left the hospital with a feeding tube um, and a continuous glucose monitor. I said, I, I can't poke my baby, you know, all day long, every day. Um, and so at seven months old, she was fitted with a Dexcom and, um, we have relied on that device to really keep her alive for the last six years. Um, and my full-time job has been 24 hours a day watching that sugar and doing feeds based on the sugar. Um, and then I actually found a drug trial specific to um, her disorder and got her enrolled in it. And um, she, the drug has changed our lives um, dramatically. And so she is really a pretty typical six-year-old with a few little extra pieces added to her body. Um, but it definitely, these devices keep her alive and keep, you know, this Dexcom, I watch it 24 hours a day and her um, aide watches it at school. She carries her own little fanny pack with um, her iPhone in it that she knows when it buzzes, she needs to tell someone. And it's pretty amazing because we were told she would probably never walk or talk. And she's about the spunkiest little six-year-old you've ever seen. So again, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm really excited to do this for her. Thank you, Heather. And um, as someone who's been in the clinical trial space for most of my career, I, I, it, it just gives me the chills, like hearing what you said about the clinical trial. Um, because for me, like that's why I did what I did was to help folks like your daughter. Um, and I can't help but not, uh, not shed a few tears here as a mom because I'm sure it's been... Uh, my hat goes off to you um, because we would do whatever we can for our kids um, as a mother. Um, so my hat, my hat goes off to you. Um, before we move on with questions, because I already could ask uh, Mary Jo and Heather a bunch of questions, um, I would love to introduce Allie um, and welcome you. Um, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, and I'd love for you to just spend a few moments um, in telling your story to everyone. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. My name is Allie. I go by the pronouns she and her. I'm a white female with a um, orange and white top on and a power wheelchair with an office background and blonde hair and big orange earrings. Um, so by day, um, I am a corporate disability strategy consultant for multiple, corp multiple corporations around the world. Um, and my story started out when I was 27 years old. I was living in my home in the out island in the Bahamas. Um, and I was a technical analysis day trader. I still do that today. And I took a shallow water dive and I just hit sand. 
and I shattered my vertebrae and sustained a C6 spinal cord injury. It took us 22 hours on an out island with no doctors um, directing our own medical care to get to Miami, uh, where I uh, underwent emergency surgery with a spinal fusion leaving me a C6 quadriplegic paralyzed from the chest down with paralyzed hands and up, um, limited upper body mobility. My English father said to me in all seriousness that, kid, you broke your body, not your brain, get to work. So in a very English fashion, he put me to work. But the next seven years of my life, I spent in and out of hospitals with multiple surgeries, with cervical cancer, pulmonary embolisms, hyperthyroidism, um, stage four pressure sores down to the bone, life-threatening spinal cysts, where I actually had to move to China because the United States healthcare system failed me for a number of reasons. So I was quite literally in military mode for seven years of my life, um, working full-time as a day trader, but with no sense of community. I moved to Raleigh in 2015, and I developed a very late, large stage four pressure sore on my tailbone, multiple surgeries, um, poor surgeons, a lot of... Um, uh, unfortunate circumstances. And during this year in bed, I was denied medically necessary equipment. I needed to not only survive in my life, but to thrive. So um, I'm very tenacious. My middle name is Pleasantly Persistent. And I started to fight health insurance companies by writing letters of medical necessity, back them up by peer-reviewed journal articles, and um, learn teaching myself how to navigate the health insurance appeals process. Um, I wish I would have chosen a more fun advocacy topic, but one that needed uh, attention deeply, and this work went national. And so my passion in life is patient care advocacy um, with respect to getting patients in on the ground level with uh, medical technologies, understanding health insurance, and getting what they need to not only survive, um, not just for those with mobility impairments in my situation, but people with all disabilities and all chronic conditions, whatever they may be. I live my life. I have a lot of, I'm the bionic woman. <laughs> I have a lot of um, uh, some uh, uh, metal in my neck from laminectomies and, and different surgeries, but I rely full-time on durable medical equipment for my survival, from catheters to power wheelchairs to my legs. They, they are my legs. So um, I dedicate at least 20 to 30% of my week to patient care advocacy on a lot of different fronts, on healthcare equity access. Um, and also it's a passion of mine to get all patients um, involved in the beginning stages of the development of these clinical trials. I have been involved in several clinical trials myself um, around the world. Uh, they failed. They almost killed me. I have um, coded, I think, seven times. It's very challenging to kill me. I'm like the Energizer Bunny on wheels. I just keep coming back. <laughs> um, but I find it my life's purpose and mission to stand up for those because, as many of you know, and your stories are very touching, um, sometimes um, those with disabilities or caregivers, and I have 24 seven hour caregivers out of pocket because I don't get Medicare or Medicaid. So I have to work 12, 14 hours a day just to survive uh, with my expenses. Many people can't fight for themselves. They're trying to survive on a daily basis. I feel fortunate and blessed despite what I've um, had to overcome to be able to be a voice for others. So Allie, <clears throat> excuse me. So first of all, it's wonderful to meet you. Um, the Pleasure. first thing, the first thing that comes to mind, uh, which was not in my prepared questions, but I always use the phrase: uh, "It's like you're the, you become the CEO of your own health." Um, yeah, the, or I run an HR firm. Yes, you're in charge. Uh, yes. So, so maybe I'll ask more about that later. And uh, people that have been on panels with me before know I always come up with questions as we get into like these wonderful, wonderful discussions, but. Uh, I had many images of uh, Ali as the CEO as you were you were doing your introduction, um, and uh, you're right. Like we all we all have a story, and um, that's the power. And I know you know our first speaker speaker mentioned this. Like you can't just talk to one patient who has a condition and compare that person to all the other situations. Like everyone has a very unique story. It's their diagnosis journey. It's their treatment. Um, you know, we can't just have one voice in this whole ecosystem. And, you know, I think despite, you know, obviously all the software and technology advances, like it's just still tough as the patient, as the advocate, and as someone who might be caring, like in Mary Jo's case, um, or, uh, or Heather for her daughter, um, as the caregiver. Um, and, you know, I look forward to, uh, to dipping into some, uh, some meaty topics today. Um, so Mary Jo, I know, um, obviously, 
um, you know, things happen with your sister, um, you know, you have, this all kind of like happens, but like, can you talk me through a little bit about like when in your mind you kind of transitioned from us like being her, you know, a sister to being a patient advocate and caregiver and like, how'd you, how'd you begin to, to go through that process yourself? I think you're, uh, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. It, it it started almost immediately because, um, as I always tell everybody, I'm the I'm the oldest and the bossiest in my family, <laughs> and I, um, I I really felt that we di we didn't know, and and here we were all ticking time bombs, and at the time didn't even know that, and I I immediately sensed that that well, first of all, she was in a coma for four months, and we took turns at the hospital just because we. We wanted we wanted someone there um, for the worst. And um, following that, she was another two years in the hospital. And um, I had just graduated from college and I had a completely different job in a totally different industry than than in healthcare. And it occurred to me right then that I I couldn't be, I was I was the tide soap lady in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I realized I couldn't sell Tide soap. I needed to do something in healthcare. And again, as I said earlier, figure out what happened to her and how could this happen to a young athlete? She was a she was an athlete. She was a scholar. She was she was amazingly talented. And and then she was just felled. And um as I said, it it this should not happen to anybody and it shouldn't happen uh to any family. So that was really what launched me. And I I interviewed with over 40 companies to get a job in the healthcare industry, any job. I took anything I could get. And that got me into critical care and then into defibrillators and ECG systems. And, and it just, it allowed me to be right in the trenches making devices that could diagnose these types of conditions and also fix them. So defibrillators, this was before we had automated defibrillators. And, and so, that was the process and um and from there then into advocacy where i was really in the really in the in the meat of it where i could actually talk to patients and talk to companies and talk to physicians and and get them to rally behind our patients so that was how it started you know and it's it's interesting you know you're if i, if I even think about the start of my own career and then how things have have the path I've gone down, like some of it's been driven by like life experiences and what we feel passionate about and, you know, our calling. And, you know, I always, I've always believed that some of those things happen for a reason. And it sounds similar to like, you know, your calling to obviously get more involved to help, help your sister and help other families. So, so that completely resonates with me. Um, Heather, you know, obviously, you know, the patient experience of your daughter, again, I can't, um, I can't even begin to put in words, because again, I have two kids myself, um, two boys, um, you know, I know what it's like to be a mom and I know what it's like to be pregnant and be expecting your baby. And like, you have all these things in your mind and then to be, you know, sort of dealt the cards that you, you were dealt. Um, and I'm just curious as you were going through the process as, as a young mom, you know, how did you kind of go through that transition from from mom to to caregiver to patient advocate for your daughter? I mean, I don't know. It it, it just, you know, my husband. We we have another child. He's sixteen, a sixteen year old son, and he is my easy kid. You know, super healthy, never sick with anything. Um, and so we learned nothing with him. And so when Lila got sick my husband was always with me, you know, we always did things together because we really didn't know, you know, everything was always up in the air. And I watched him be able to process information that they were telling him and then spit out questions. And he really taught me like, I can't just sit in the background, you know, before with my son, the pediatrician would say, oh, he's got this, take this antibiotic, you know, but I would never ever like question something that they said or question their course of treatment. And I remember the first time I was made to um, meet with a dietitian in the endocrinology department. And um, she 
the very first thing she said to me was, I don't know anything about tube feeds. Well, that was the only way my kid was fed at that point. Mm -hmm. So already I'm like, oh, this is going to go well. And then she told me we needed to cut calories. And I just, I literally said to her, you have to stop. Do you even know why my child is here today? And she looked at me and it was at that moment, you know, before I would have just sat back and just been like, well, okay, you know, how can we cut food, even though my kid's severely hypoglycemic? Um, And she said, I guess I don't understand. And I was like, well, let me tell you a little bit about my daughter. And then I went in to tell her about, you know, how I would have to unhook her from her feeding tube from her formula and shoot just plain sugar water in her belly to bring her sugar up, you know, just to keep her alive. So it was at that moment where it was like, I realized that these people are working for me, you know, um, and I'm really the one in charge until Lila's an adult, if she can make her own medical decisions, you know, um, and that was like really empowering to realize, like, I don't need to just sit and listen, you know, meekly. I have to stand up for my kid, you know, like I have to make sure these people realize that I know what I'm talking about and I, I, I've got her, you know, like she, I, I've got this. And it, it took a while to prove that, but people don't mess with me anymore. <laughs> her team knows yeah. I've got it. I don't think anyone's going to mess with anyone on this call. So I was like, <laughs> I got to give everyone a virtual, I'm going to give everyone a virtual hug when we're done. But uh, no, I think there's something powerful in what you just said that really resonates with me is that I remember even going through the breast cancer, which by the time I got diagnosed with a brain tumor, similar to uh, to Allie, I, th- I think it was like, get out of my way, I'm in charge. I had, I had a very, uh, I was very in charge of the situation at that point. But um, what I realized is that like for a while, I was just like taking information and answering and like almost felt like I didn't have control of the situation. And then I realized, and it was through coaching from two other, I call them my angels that were basically, you're the warrior preparing for battle and like, don't let anyone get in your way. And if you're not satisfied with how you're being treated or what you're being told, like you're in charge. Um, And I, I think that's the biggest bit of advice I give to anyone who's a patient going through something. Everyone again has their own story, but like you have to feel empowered to take control of the situation. Um, so obviously, and, you know, caring for your daughter, um, you know, I, we could go on about this probably for the whole rest of the day, but, you know, what are some resources or from your perspective, gaps um, as a caregiver that you just don't, you just don't have today that you really wish you had? Um, I will say our biggest challenge has been um, health care coverage for her. My husband's self-employed and, you know, I'm her full-time caregiver. Um, and so we were able to get Medicaid for her for a while, but then of course we were over income. So it took me over a year to get her approved to be on a waiver in Ohio. Um, maybe other states are easier. I don't know. Ohio was not easy. Um, and it was like the biggest relief to know that, okay, you know, I'm going to be able to continue to get this quality of care for my child. Um, And I still, you know, we have pharmacy issues with the drug that she takes. We have to get it from a specialty pharmacy. Well, it's not in network with her insurance. So then we have to use a different pharmacy. And between that and then the the DME issues with the feeding tubes, that that's our biggest challenge. And I say to my husband all the time, like, I am a smart person and I have the time to sit on the phone and argue with people and tell them what's correct and what they're going to do for me. Um, but it, it's, it saddens me the amount of people that don't have that, you know, either the time or the ability to, to fight for themselves. Yep. No, uh, completely resonates with me too. And, uh, I can think of some situations where I've been talking to people that just feel defeated and it's like, I give up, I, I can't get anywhere. And, trying to find the energy to keep fighting, um, as you said, like in being able to being able to do that to drive things forward. Um, now, Mary Jo, I know obviously just in terms of patient experience, just from another angle, you know, you're dependent on a device. Um, you know, what are the some of the some of the challenges that you face in in you know using it, as well as are there any recent 
you know, improvements or changes that really impact you day to day? I always joke about um, metal detectors. Um, you know, it, I got my device at, our, at a relatively young age. When you think about it, uh, I, I was in my late 40s when I got my first device. And going through an airport metal detector, it's like, hey, look at me. Everybody from TSA, I've got to explain to them um, that I have an ICD. The, the good news now is that body scanners kind of hide that a little bit. But um, that's just that's just pretty much, that's an easy thing. That's no big deal. Um, one thing that I, I want to bring up, and as I'm listening to everyone, you know, the term PTSD is tossed around an awful lot these days. Um, but for someone who has survived cardiac arrest or someone who has gone through what everyone on this panel has gone through, it's a real thing. It's real. And, and we are easily triggered by uh, a lot of different experiences in our life. I'll tell you what, waking up on waking up with a on a ventilator with a tube down your throat is uh, is I I can I can in my mind's eye see that tube all the time, and and uh, I think that that's that's something that is um, you know we can, we sort of get used to our situation, but then there will be little things little things that that trigger it and. Um, it brings us right back. It brings us right back to that fear and that concern. And one of the things, you know, you ask about technologies. Um, one of the things that can happen is um, anytime there's an advisory about any device. So if, for example, if a company has an advisory about uh, an implanted defibrillator or any type of implanted device, the way that a patient sees that, even if it isn't their device, they're thinking, okay, if the device made by that company can fail, when is mine going to fail? Exactly. I uh, not to interrupt you, but oh yeah, I see everyone shaking their head. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And um, I think that that's something that needs to be taken into account too, is that it, it may seem like nothing to the manufacturers or to FDA or anyone else, but but when we see those, it immediately puts us back to that. And and what what Heather is saying about insurance, those are the kinds of of, of daily spikes. Being not being able to get a medication, um, not being able to get insurance. Uh, I had a a a, a family a, a mother called me one time to say that she and her kid had been kicked out of their carpool because um, other parents found out that the mother had an implanted defibrillator. And even though she'd never had a cardiac arrest, she got it out of a, a, an abundance of caution because her sister had long QT syndrome. And so she got her ICD. They wouldn't let her drive the carpool or have her child in the carpool. And, and these are the sorts of day-to-day -day things that impact every one of us that are that are living with devices or living with some type of health condition. No, I mean, and that that brings up a whole nother, uh, uh, you know, there's the stereotyping and, you know, and labeling uh, that happens. And, um, you know, your, your, uh, your uh, story about the metal detectors, you talk about triggering situations. I remember myself uh, that happening twice um, and it was pretty embarrassing as it was like the TSA agents were making a really big deal about it. And all I wanted to do is get to my flight and get to where I was going. Um, so no, I, I completely uh, hear you in terms of triggering events. Um, Allie, I'm just curious from your perspective, um, you know, what would you say, you know, are some of the most significant unmet needs? Um, and is there any particular medical device technology or healthcare system specifically that, you know, you think should be, be getting addressed? I'm going to echo a little bit of Mary and Heather touches on both of these points. With Mary, it speaks very deeply to me on the PTSD. I too woke up intubated in China on ibuprofen after spinal surgery because I didn't understand pain management. And um, uh, when I woke up, because I, I passed out from pain, and they found morphine, and they overdosed me three times. And so I still have moments, right? So grief comes and goes, and it's those smallest of moments, hearing someone hiking of a friend that's hiking in Australia right now. And I remember a moment, because I used to be an avid hiker, 
Um, and I think that really needs to be taken into consideration as well. And then to that question, what Heather said, I really want to expand on that. The most significant unmet need. First off, there are so many medical device technologies that I need, I would like, um, that I don't have access to. And they are out there because this speaks directly to our systemically broken healthcare system in the United States. While many of us are advocating and legislating, and I'm on many coalitions in DC, changing, we have to learn to work within a broken system first. The challenge is, unless you were in the corporation, you have these gorgeous PPO plans, which we would all love. I would love that. But I too, Heather, like your husband, I'm an independent contractor. I work for myself. I pay everything out of pocket. I don't qualify for Medicare or Medicaid. So when Obamacare came out, um, I had to pay full price, but I had access to everything I needed. Um, this, the plans, and this is not, it, it's in a gray area, it's legal, but from uh, discrimina discrimination against pre-existing conditions, it's coming right back into full force because with these marketplace plans that many of us have to purchase, or even with Medicare and Medicaid, they're shrinking our networks. Now, for a very healthy, able-bodied person who doesn't have medical conditions, that's fine. For many of us with complex medical diagnoses who need to see these specialists, I can't even see them. Um, 72 hours ago, I was um, diagnosed with um, skin cancer. And I was at the dermatologist. And they, um, uh, when they came back with the results, they gave me very long, fancy names. And I think this comes to a question later. I understand medical um, terminology because of my father, but many people don't. <laughs> and they said, well, we have a specialist. He was not in my network anymore. And I said, well, you know, where would you like me to go? Oh, we don't know. So I'm an avid researcher. So I did my own homework copiously, I called many um, places, got prior authorizations, wrote my own prior authorizations in the last 24 hours um, to get to see these specialists. And so many people don't have the ability, as Heather mentioned, or the know-how or the time. And it's overwhelming because of the PTSD and the stress and the mental health and the anxiety that comes with being your own advocate or caregiver or for a friend. And so I think that's one of the, you know, the most significant unmet needs is the lack of financial um, uh, stability and that fear consistently. I mean, very quickly, I met a, um, in Costa Rica, I went for my 40th birthday in April, I went with six women and I met a former executive Walmart, uh, um, Walmart executive, very high up. And she was diagnosed with cancer several years earlier. And even with her beautiful retirement plan and Medicare, she couldn't afford the treatments. Her husband has had to go back to work in the corporate world. And these are individuals who are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So if we don't have access to these medical technologies, even if they're available because of our health insurance plans, and that is definitely not a one we're going to bite off today. But I think that 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 is on my mind on a daily basis with hundreds of friends who are on Medicare and Medicaid, and they're told how many catheters they can get a month. They're told by Medicaid how many times they can go pee in a day. Think about that. That is so ethically and morally wrong on so many levels. And many of us are addressing this. Yep. Now, and I know, uh, I know Kurt and Jen are keeping track from uh, even just the last 30 minutes of our conversation with all the other topics that we can talk about uh, as part of, uh, part of some other MBAC sessions. But now you're completely right. I mean, insurance and care and who has access to it um, and, you know, you can be very, uh, to that person you referenced, you know, financially sound and like still not have access to treatment. Um, and so like, it's really, really uh, discouraging. Uh, before we sort of transition from, uh, from patient experience to sort of talking about uh, caregivers, um, I'm curious, Heather, just in terms of, you know, obviously getting information um, and getting educated about alternatives um, and treatment for your daughter. Um, what is that journey? What has that journey been like? And, you know, what advice can you give to others who might be trying to navigate something similar? Well, we're lucky because we live in Cincinnati and the only other place I'd want to be with Lila is Boston. You know, we're, we have an amazing children's hospital. Um, and in the beginning, you know, we were thrown at practically every specialty they offer at Children's and we met with genetics and we did all the genetic testing and I thought they were going to be some like amazing part of our team. And 
they got us our diagnosis. It took a year, but we, we got there. We got it genetically and they are completely useless to us now. Um, thankfully, no one is making us see them anymore um, because honestly, I get all of my information um, from like this social media group um, on Facebook that we have specific to um, either patients or caregivers of those with Lila's disorder. You know, when there's less than 400 in the whole world, I think there's only 700 people in this group and I know most of them, you know, and it's, that's where I get all my good information. Um, I know if, if something new pops up with Lila, I, you know, that's the first place I go when she does something amazing. That's where I go to brag about her. Um, and it's so funny because like, I love these other people in this group, like they're my own family, you know, like, because even with her, within her disorder, there's a huge spectrum, you know, some are profoundly disabled, you know, many of them don't speak. Um, and then there are others who really, unless you have a trained eye, you ha would have no idea that they have anything going on. And they are, they're where I heard about the drug trial. Um, that's where I learned about blood sugar. And um, it, I, I can tell you that I know of at least three parents who have messaged me and said to me, if you hadn't screamed at me virtually, of course, um, about blood sugar, you know, I don't know that my kid would still be here. You saved my child's life because for whatever reason, the medical field, because it's, you know, they're dealing with such a small sample size, they don't care. You know, um, I have about two doctors on Lila's team who really do care um, and they go above and beyond. But this group, they just, they are amazing. They, they are my people. Um, and that's, they're my biggest um, asset, honestly, to Lila's care. No, for sure. And uh, you bring up your point about like social media groups. I'm actually part of a couple of Facebook groups myself, um, in particular for my brain tumor, because it couldn't be completely removed. Um, and I have a chance of it coming back. And I go every six months for an MRI and I hear what it's doing about what it's doing. But I've continue to learn signs to look out for and get support uh, within a common circle. Um, but that was a circle I had to find on my own, which it sounds like, you know, you did the very same thing and, you know, having some uh, commonality with people, not only for support, but just sharing of information because there's so much information to share in so many unique situations like you described. Um, I do actually, I lied, have one more question um, because Mary Jo, I was just thinking, and I know we talked about this a little bit, when we first met, but, you know, just in terms of like working with your sister from a patient experience perspective, like what are your thoughts on like where we're headed with digital solutions and telehealth and like, how does that come into the whole equation um, in, in supporting your sister as well as yourself? Well, I mean, the good news is, is that, is that we have remote monitoring for our devices, our implanted devices. Um, and there's obviously there's the pandemic, was making all of us, you know, virtual, and and we were we were seeing our doctors across screens or over the phone. Um, but my remote monitor monitors my device every day. Quarterly, I send a report into uh, transmission into my cardiologist. Currently, I'm living two and a half hours away from my cardiologist, so that's it's wonderful. But I will say that I think that we have to be we have to have caution about um, not having that direct face to face not over a screen, but in an office with a physician. I'm retired from emergency medical services as well. And one of the things that we were taught is looking at a patient immediately and saying, sick, not sick. Um, and you do that by just touching their skin. Is it dry? Is it moist? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it, is it what's, the, what's, what's the color of it? What's their pulse feel like? You know, those are the sorts of things that you can't get across the screen. And so there has to be a balance between that that virtual, digital, remote um, capability and seeing your doctor and your doctor seeing you in person. Um, so I, I don't think we can get away from that. We shouldn't get away from that. 
No, and that's a whole uh, remote monitoring, just putting on my clinical trial hat. That takes me down a whole nother path of conver conversation that we could uh, we could have. But I agree with you. You can't replace the in-person aspect of, of care. Um, mm -hmm. And it's definitely something as all these digital technologies continue to move forward, we definitely need to keep in the keep in the back of our mind. Um, can, I, all, can, oh, sorry, can, I, can I go back to um, the discussion about social media? Sure, sure. I, I really, I feel very strongly, and this is something I do as on the Patient Safety Advisory Board, is I monitor all of the different um, uh, online groups that are, have, to have to do with implanted pacemakers, defibrillators, you know, those sorts of things. And I just, I monitor those uh, partly just to see what patients or other patients are talking about, but also for course correction because there can be a lot of misinformation out there. And that's just as, da that's as dangerous as no information. It's more yeah. dangerous than no information. And I'm always amazed when I see companies, companies have all these resources on their websites, but where are patients going to ask the questions that they could find answers to on the website or by calling the company? They're going to social media. And it's because we trust, we trust other patients because as patients, we know our bodies better than anybody else does. And, um, we go to talk to other patients because they get us, they understand us. And that's also something that family, in, in dealing with, with families, we as patients know how we're feeling. Our family members don't. And it's very difficult for them to be around us if, if they can't know what, what we're feeling. And so I think that we also have to pay attention, not just to the patient, but to their families and help their families understand as well. No, that's very valid. And, uh, you know, being around other patients, like just in this community, I know we're all, uh, we've all, we were all strangers before we got pulled together for today's session, but just being around and surrounded by other patients, it's, it's therapeutic, it's supportive, um, you know, and the point you, you raise is like, that's completely, uh, completely accurate. Um, I'm curious, Allie, as you, you know, obviously, um, in the entire experience that you shared, you know, and we've just been obviously talking about digital technologies, like how has your whole patient experience changed and shifted due to all the, the changes happening in the digital health, digital health world? From a digital health perspective for me personally, and also hundreds of individuals I work with, because I work with individuals in different capacities with all disabilities, um, those who move, sense, think, um, differently from chronic conditions to blind, low vision, deaf, hard of hearing, mobility impairments. One really great from um, a result from COVID from a digital health perspective is a lot of these apps now are more friendly from booking appointments to finding your test results. And so the information is more the information is more accessible. The way in which the information is displayed is not necessarily accessible from an intellectual and or um, physical standpoint from a screen reader perspective. Or um, I was also in the last 30 days diagnosed with um, on the portal from a CT scan, they said I have um, facet arthropathy and hypertrophy leading to spinal stenosis. I know what that means. If a patient who doesn't understand medical talk, it's a fancy word for saying your vertebrae are um, narrowing due to arthritis and enlarging of the vertebrae joints. So that's pushing on a spinal nerve due to, and then my metal in my neck is essentially pushing into my bone. That was a fancy way. And if a patient reads that on their portal, and I called the doctor right away because I wanted to chat with them about this. I couldn't get a hold of anyone. I tried to book an appointment. I tried to use their chat function. I was on hold for an hour. So we're definitely making steps in the right direction. And I think we need to celebrate the small wins because there's, you know, just as Mary mentioned with misinformation on social media groups, there are the naysayers, like several percent sometimes of naysayers. Their voices are louder than those that are actually getting real help. But we have to consistently iterate the process. But how do we do that? We have to do that with data. How do we do that with data? That comes from focus groups and surveys and reaching out to patient organizations. Um, and I have many patient organizations I'm part of that want to be involved um, in improving digital health and getting involved in clinical trials and medical device technologies, but they don't have access. They don't know where to start. But these medical device companies, they also want these patients. And there's a disconnect of how are we making these connections and partnering together. 
No, and that, you know, that also brings up, you know, the whole topic of uh, patient engagement and advocacy. And, you know, if you think about, you know, there's all these groups that want to help and like, you don't know where to start. So if that's a group of people, like, how does it feel for a patient who just gets diagnosed with some or, or given some like exactly. really horrible news? Like, where do you go? Um, you know, I've been there twice. Um, but I knew the second time I was like, I'm going right to, I'm, I'm taking this in control to myself, doing my research and, you know, using my network, which honestly ended up being my professional network to try to get me to, like, for example, to, the only two surgeons in Boston that would take my case for my brain tumor. Um, but it was because just- Because Ami, was, you're curious and you ask questions and yep. one connection leads to another in relationships, but there are a lot of patients who don't sadly mm -hmm. have the ability or know how or know how to even start. That's why we're all here together today. Yep. yep. So Allie, just building upon what you were just talking about and, you know, as we think about, you know, obviously sh shifting from that digital health question to, you know, what would your advice to be? Because obviously on this call today, like there's this group of us that all, all have this uh, patient theme in common, but, you know, for patients that might be listening to this call, might listen to the recording, like how do you think it's best for patients to actually engage and interact with industry to help drive what, what is needed to, uh, to, 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 to see change happen? That's a really tricky question. And I, I don't think everyone's going to like my answer, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. If you're an individual patient and you want to engage with industry or companies or clinical trials, and you don't know where to start, you're going to be spending hours on the internet. And oftentimes people want to look at the source of where a lot of these articles or trials may come from. So my greatest advice would be to whatever your condition is or diagnoses, find an advocacy group within that, whether it's mobility impairment or cancer or heart disease, reach out to them, see if they have the connections first um, with the larger organizations. We have to start there. And oftentimes Many of these larger national organizations, um, for whatever the medical condition may be, they have local chapters. I'm a big believer in local chapters. They have so much more weight and pull um, because I'm a board member on way too many boards, national and local ones. Um, and I can tell you, we, many of us just get more done at the local level because just like social media groups, we have that personal connection that Mary was chatting about, about just seeing your doctor in person meeting people in face and building, you don't only build community, you build family, you build camaraderie, you build information, good information together. But then that in turn has to result in, okay, now we all have this information. Are we going to create a group um, on social media or a newsletter or posts? Or how are we going to disseminate this information? Very quick example, on my um, one of my spinal cord injury Facebook groups, um, there's dozens of them. I have one I love because they're very informative. People come up with these incredible adaptive solutions for their homes every day, but it's stuck on those private groups. There's not one global repository to share these ideas. It's like it's organizations like NDIC, and I was talking to Kurt about this, that we want to build this infrastructure, this digital infrastructure to share these ideas and resources. And, no, exactly. And oh, sorry, go ahead. So that was advice for patients, advice for industry. Industry, industry used to, at least in my my space, used to fund um, it, when I was when I was directing the Care Foundation, used to fund what we called heart to heart meetings, and this was done and and it, it was done locally, uh, as Ali was saying, chapters it was done in a in a in a major city. It would involve a hospital. There would be a speaker. We would bring families together, and because these were fa fairly rare disorders. It would be the first time that a lot of families and patients would actually meet somebody else with the same condition. You know, you think you've got horns growing out of your head because you've got this rare condition, but then you meet other people and you find out you're not alone. And that can be done virtually. And it's much now much more cost effective to do it virtually, but just bringing people together, knowing that, that they have, and, and being able to literally talk to one another, not just type on the, on the computer, um, for a Facebook group or social media group, but actually being able to have this sort of a forum where people could talk to one another, that's something that industry could do and 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 start that up again. Find those advocacy groups and start at the grassroots from there to reach out to patients. And you know, we're 
we're the choir here. We're the ones who are very involved. We're very active. But think about all the, 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 the majority of patients who are just sitting back and they don't know where to go. You could really, you could really start to push that out to, to engage those, those patients and get them more involved. No, and you bring up a good point. I mean, I think about, you know, obviously we have all different populations, demographics that obviously are patients, you know, we've been talking about digital technology, but not everyone is all of us are, I think, connected to all the digital stuff. So how, how do you continue to get information to people who need it, need it the most? Um, and, uh, you know, that's really critical as well as, you know, I've even thought, you know, you get a diagnosis or you're told by a physician something, but sometimes it's like, oh, and your next appointment's going to be, but you're not necessarily provided resources to connect you to other patients or be able to start this process. Like you have to kind of do it on your own, um, but you have to have a drive um, and know how to be able to do it. And a lot of people, um, as you just emphasized, you know, don't um, and, you know, trying to obviously help them, help them too. Um, now I would be remiss uh, without uh, the opportunity, um, given all the hot topics that are going on, um, obviously shifting gears here a little bit. You know, if you think about patient, being a patient and patient advocacy, um, as well as obviously AI and ML has been like a huge and hot topic uh, going on in, in the industry. Um, I'm really curious, um, you know, from each of your perspectives and maybe Mary Jo, we'll start with you. Um, you know, where do you think um, AI is gonna play a role with, you know, medical device development and market use? And just curious your perspective on, on where we go from here with it. That's that's a, that's a question I've, I've thought a lot about, and um, you know, because of this, the work I've done in electrocardiograms, we've had automated uh, automated ECG interpretations since the '70s. So if you think about it, we've had sort of a, the start of of AI there, and I think that the way that you you um, position AI with patients, because we're talking about patients here, is give them an analogy and. It, any of this group, um, we've probably all had an ECG, an EKG at some point. If you look at the top of it, it says, you know, it gives you all the interpretive information. That's done by a computer. Um, so AI is not a big stretch as far as I'm concerned. And I think you have to position it with an analogy that, that a patient can connect to, to say, all right, so, you know, we're sitting here talking to your doctor. Do you know that um, uh, the scribe system that's going to take all this information in from our discussion here in the office is going to go through an AI type device to put that into your electronic health record? So that's something they might be able to connect with. And I think that that's how we position it with patients to make them more comfortable with the idea of AI. I, I, AI I've worked with a few companies. Um, if you look at the huge data sets that are created in a sleep study, for example, or in a clinical trial, ECG monitoring in a clinical trial that you're, familiar, you're all familiar with, those are huge data sets. And AI will be a, a tremendous help in those, in, in just wrangling that data down to something that's actionable. No, I mean, those data sets are huge just from obviously all my work with clinical trials. And you're right, I mean, We've been collecting a lot of information for a while, but it, you know we haven't been focusing as much on it and uh, really thinking about you know where do we go with it next. And I do agree with you. We got to control control the narrative. I'm curious, Heather. Obviously, as a caregiver for your daughter and you know everything going on with us, you know as a mom, you know how are you feeling about the use of AI um, as it relates to to the industry? So when I saw this question on the um list that Kurt emailed us, I read it out loud to my husband and I said, I have not thought for 30 seconds of my life about AI and, you know, our journey. And he was like, that's fine. Just say that. I mean, I, I feel like we're still so much in the trenches, you know, with Lila that I, that's like down on the horizon for me, you know, and not even on my radar at this point. No, that's fair. And, and I'm sure there's plenty of other caregivers and patients that probably feel the same way. Um, it's like going on around us, but obviously it's whatever we need to focus on that's like, that's right in front of us. Um, Allie, I'm just curious for you, um, what are your thoughts on, on AI and ML and how it folds into this whole equation? Uh, it's a really interesting question and a timely one. 
First of all, I use AI every day. It's in my daily life and with assistive technology as a quadriplegic. But I was at a healthcare conference just last week at the University of Chapel Hill on the rising um, cost of drug prices in the health marketplace. It was a um, it was a very depressing conference, but there was this one panel on AI technology. And we had, there were some um, experts from different medical technology companies. And they said, listen, um, patients sometimes get scared of AI because they think of Terminator, that they're going to come over and, and, a, and a tablet is going to diagnose us in five seconds. And he goes, that's not the reality. People, that's what he said. He goes, you know, for the coming years, it's going to be very boring. It's going to be taking these mass amount of data sets and inputting them uh, in this information to charts. So doctors and nurses and our healthcare professionals can focus more on the patient and less on the paperwork side. And I have to think critically about that, you know, and I was like, yeah, you know, yeah, I don't think Terminator is coming to town anytime soon. Um, but I do appreciate every time I log into a portal, even on my phone, Walgreens, to order my prescription. Um, I only got the app a year ago. I don't know why. Otherwise, you have to call your doctor and you have to wait. Walgreens, you press a button. That's all AI. It's very convenient and it's life. It's like if it saves me 10 minutes, I spend about 12 hours a month on the phone with Blue Cross and Blue Shield fighting about something. If I can just take an hour of that, that month back, right, on certain little apps, to me, that, that's life changing. No, it is life changing. And as you said, it all adds up. Um, and, you know, but it's, I think it's all in how, um, you know, all of us being, I think, educated and being in industry like you're able to kind of get your head around it more easily and like feel more scary. comfortable with it mm -hmm. versus you know i can think of some people who might not be as maybe tech savvy or or is just you know educated from an industry perspective being you know apprehensive and not trusting it and especially as it relates to something like a medication being confident that you're still going to like get it on time if it's something obviously that you rely on rely on to live mm -hmm. um i think that's critical um, I'm curious, just before we, uh, hopefully in the time we have left, um, dive into a question from the audience, but I'm just curious, Mary Jo, in wrapping up the, this question around AI, you know, what do you think, you know, there's obviously trying to explain how AI and ML are used to patients, um, and, you know, what, just from your perspective, like, what are the challenges from the advocacy and industry perspective when engaging with patients on, on how AI is used? Well, one of the things that came to mind is, as Allie was talking about, about medications is that uh, in that conference, you know, to the, the, flip, the flip side and the, the benefit is that, for example, um, patients with long QT syndrome, there are, there's a whole host of drugs that we can't take because they, they further prolong the QT interval, which could put us into cardiac arrest, ventricular fibrillation, and then cardiac arrest. Um, the good news about about an AI type of system is, let's say that that someone doesn't completely understand the issues around long QT syndrome, prescribes a drug to me, and AI can catch that by by knowing that information, um, and and rather than giving that to me, my pharmacist gets uh, a red flag that says, you know, this patient probably shouldn't be taking this medication. That's a benefit. And I think that that's how we have to turn it is just give somebody a very simple example that that says, this is a safety thing. This this can help you. Um, and so, I mean, that's how I see it. That's what came to mind as Allie was talking. Oh, sorry. One last thing, Mary Jo, to add to that too, AI, it's going to reduce a lot of medical errors, the wrong CPT code, the wrong diagnosis code that we make. That's a human error. And that's, I think that's a big benefit of AI as well. Yeah, because the medical system's not perfect. Sometimes I think because it's like labeled the medical system, everyone just assumes that like everything's not talking to talking. each other and, work, right. and working exactly. really well. Yeah, and working really well. And like it makes mistakes too. So it's, you know what I mean? Like to try to help that I think is, I think is really important. Um, we did get a question before I move on to my very last question, um, which I would love each of you to answer. We got an actually very interesting question from the audience which I didn't think about in advance of this, but was a great one is, um, and maybe we'll start uh, Mary Jo with you is, um, the question was just around like cybersecurity with medical devices and in all of this whole conversation. And, you know, um, you know, how have cybersecurity concerns in your perspective um, been communicated to patients based upon your experience? 
this this question has come it comes up uh, frequently on the um, safety advisory board and the good news is is that companies that have these types of devices have have put focus on it and and they're paying they're paying good attention to it and if a patient were to ask me well, what about cybersecurity and say trust me the the industry is looking at this because it has come up and and no, they can't shut your defibrillator down over the internet if you're the president of the United States. I don't know if anybody saw that show, but um, yep. yeah, no, they yep. can't. <laughs> and industry, industry is focused on it. So I feel confident as a patient that I, it's not something I have to worry about and I would communicate that to others. And Allie, what's your thoughts on this? I'm gonna take a page out of Heather's husband's playbook. I have not thought about it that much. I'm not in, I'm not that concerned about it. Um, a urinary tract infection can kill me in 48 hours from sepsis. So honestly, it does not keep me up at night. Exactly the right yeah. answer, Kelly. It's exactly the right answer. We've got big fish to fry. <laughs> hey, you know, you gotta you gotta keep it all in perspective. And honestly, that's a great um, I love the analogy because if you just think about you know, you pick up your phone and especially if you have alerts set up on websites, you can just, you can suddenly see information. And this kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier that affects you based upon your condition. And then you start to think about other things. And like, at the end of the day, like you do have bigger fish to fry. Like you have the things that are right in front of you that like you need to focus on. And yeah, there may be all these other things going on around us, but it's really, uh, it's really what's, what's in the forefront. Um, I think I'm going to ask you guys both one more question um, before I ask my last question, which is, you know, obviously, um, you know, all of us are obviously living in the, in the med tech industry. Um, and, you know, what would you say is your biggest, biggest challenge, whether it be obviously um, as a patient or a caregiver um, and just interacting with medical device companies? So maybe Allie, we'll start with you. My biggest mm -hmm. challenge is with interacting with med tech companies. Thus far, I must admit, um, my advocacy career started out in a different way within health insurance and organically um, um, started, uh, kind of went down a winding road into med tech. And because I am pleasantly persistent, I love people and connections and relationships, I will email you 50 times politely <laughs> with a smile until you reach back out to me. Um, and that has afforded me beautiful opportunities to work with different medical technology companies on behalf of others. Um, the challenges I face with the handful that I'm working with and consulting with now is they don't know what they don't know. They don't know what questions to ask. They are, and there's industry trends. And I was reading papers on this before I was at the MedTech conference a few weeks ago with, um, on behalf of VD. And um, they don't know where, they want patients on the ground floor with clinical trials and, and uh, but while they're developing medical technology, um, new medical technologies, um, but they don't know where to start. They don't know where to go, which is still, it, it boggles my mind a little bit, to be honest with you. And that's what I'm helping them with. So that's a challenge that they're facing on the patient side. And I get reached out to by, um, for clinical trials, for studies all the time. And, and the, um, the panels who spoke prior to us about compensation, so many people with disabilities or complex medical diagnoses are getting asked to participate in surveys or focus groups or clinical trials. So most of the time, honestly, a lot of it's free of charge because the answer, and I've gotten this multiple times, well, we're developing this technology for you down the road. Well, my time and my experience, that's worth something, right? Yeah. And so I think there needs to be a shift in frame, the, the framework uh, in that as well. Yeah, no, I mean, there is a cost to our time. Um, and, um, I don't you know, know what do what I do to make money in life. The advocacy is because I love that, but I still have to pay my bills. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. No. And I don't think that's always something that, uh, is in, is, is in the, uh, the forefront of everyone's mind. Um, I'm curious, uh, Mary Jo, just before I go to the last question, like, what are your, what are your thoughts on this? Very simple. The patient is the customer. The physician is is the service provider not to be disrespectful but they are providing a service but at the end of the day the customer is the patient the patient is paying for this oh will they have insurance no you're paying for your insurance as well so the customer is the patient we need to remind industry of that every single time we talk to them i am your customer 
think about, you know, uh, medical device reps, they're working for the medical device company, they go meet with the physician, how often they sitting down with the patients who are actually using those using those devices um, at the end of the day um, as the customer. So I think that's completely, uh, completely relevant. Um, you know, before I move on to uh, just in closing, the last question for both of you, um, and Heather unfortunately had to go tend to her daughter. So we wish her well and just thank her for for participating with us. You know, I just want to thank everyone who has taken the time to join today, to listen to this panel, to listen to our first speaker and the uh, wonderful additional speakers that MDIC has put together as part of this, this patient panel. You know, I've had the opportunity for a number of years now to be involved with MDIC. And, you know, I couldn't be more impressed by the work that everyone does to just bring together amazing individuals with amazing stories. Um, to continue to help drive change um, in our industry. Um, you know, Mary Jo um, and Allie, you know, I just want to give you guys uh, a huge virtual hug. Uh, sharing stories are, they're triggering, they're powerful, um, and they're not easy. Um, and I just want to say thank you to both of you uh, for being here today. Um, and I just couldn't be more excited uh, to be part of this industry and have had the opportunity um, to spend time with both of you as well as Heather today. Um, you know, I would say in closing, you know, I shared my story obviously at the onset um, of our discussion a little over an hour ago. Um, and my hope coming out of today um, is that my story helps inspire other people um, to get mammograms. If you don't feel right, don't give up and keep pushing um, to get a diagnosis. You know, I didn't realize that like, being dizzy was gonna to lead to an MRI and then getting told I had a brain tumor, but that's what happened. And it only came because I advocated for myself that I didn't feel right. Um, and so I really hope that from my story that I inspire other people, you know, if you don't feel right to take action um, on, you know, making sure that you get that you get follow-up. What I would say to both of you is, you know, just in closing to this conversation this morning, you know, what is one thing that you hope the audience takes away from your story? Um, and maybe Mary Jo, I'll start with you. Thanks. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that after 40 some years in this, in this, on this journey, and yes, I started it when I was 10 years old, um, uh, 40 some years, it's so gratifying to see that industry in, and um, industries taking a serious interest in the patient and in, in listening to the patient. And I would, in closing, say, don't just listen to the patient, also listen to their families and to their caregivers, because we're all affected. Thank you, Mary Jo, and thank you so much for being here today. Um, and Allie, um, you know, what is the one thing that you hope everyone takes away from you today? Be your own self-advocate. If you can't be it for yourself, lean on the family. If you're fortunate enough to have family, as many of us do. If you don't, go to your social media group, find a group online, ask for help if you don't know the answer, if you're scared, if you're going through something, because it's not chances. There, it, there are definitely others who are dealing with the same anxiety, stress, medical conditions you are. So it all comes down to self-advocacy, whatever that means within your world. No, and that, that resonates with me um, as well, Allie. And again, um, thank you for you taking the time today. I hope uh, that I have the opportunity to uh, one day meet you and Mary Jo in person uh, to be able to continue this conversation. Um, and again, to everyone who joined us virtually, I just want to thank you for joining um, this portion of MDIC's annual patient forum. Um, please don't hesitate to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, if my network can be of help to anyone that's here um, or help any other patients, you know, that's why I'm here and that's why um, I devoted my time this morning uh, to supporting MDIC. Welcome back. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome to our second segment of the Virtual Patient Summit. In healthcare and in the medical device industry, presently, the DEI narrative is weathering an immense test of attrition and noise like none other. It is hard to discern meaningful efforts versus marketing sound bites. This often discourages many of our own allies and colleagues in the industry with fatigue against this important effort. As you can all appreciate, this requires us to change, even challenge our assumptions and 
not always seek the articulative, rinsed narratives we're all used to hearing in the digital medium. But we need to hear from those who matter, who are quietly making meaningful strides in DEI, who are at the heart of the issue and doing something about it. Those who may not have the most enticing grand narrative you're used to hearing, but who have the most meaningful. Those who may not be at the finish line of DEI, but are far from the starting point. It is with this core belief and perspective, I'm delighted and humbled to welcome you to the next part of our summit that explores DEI from the different stakeholders across the ecosystem. I would like to introduce our next set of speakers who are changing the DEI landscape where it matters and belongs. Dr. Covington, Tamara, Deidre, I hand it over to you. Good afternoon, Kurt, and thank MDIC for this opportunity to just share some information and just present uh, what we think is compelling uh, data and information for you. Um, my name is Melva Covington. I have the honor of, of, of presenting and talking with my colleagues, Deidre O'Neill and Tamara Allen. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about empowering patient-driven solutions by inclusive development, engagement, and implementation. And so I'll just very quickly start off by saying that um, I come with 25 years of experience, mostly in health outcomes research. I've done a lot of work, not only in commercialization, but strategic planning. Uh, I am the founder of Agape, excuse me, Agape Strategic Solutions, which is a female-owned uh, firm that focuses on three pillars as it relates to research and decision-making, and that is making sure that we're inclusive as it relates to underrepresented patient populations, uh, especially those who are marginalized or who have been marginalized, to provide data that will provide a compelling value proposition and to really leverage community-based input as we think about engagement and achieving solutions with our eyes focused really on reducing disparities and improving access. Um, I also would like to introduce to you uh, Miss Deidre uh, O'Neill. She's amazing. She was born and raised in Baltimore. Uh, she graduated from the Institute of Notre Dame for Girls uh, and completed her degree in communications. Um, after her first child, uh, she switched her passion from, again, acting to talking um, because she was very concerned about not only the issues that were faced, and she started really a talk show that's called Breaking Barriers, in which she interviews people to find their everyday opinions and to share their stories as a part of the Clear Production Network. In addition to that, she has four children totally, uh, and she is determined. She's amazing as she talks about breaking barriers at home, work, and in everyday uh, life. Um, so we will hear her story, particularly as it relates to maternal health. Um, I also would like to introduce to you Tamara Allen, who is also my uh, colleague and co-founder in People Empowering People for Inclusion Now. She uh, is amazing. She comes with over 20 years of experience in marketing, communications, engagement, community engagement, as well as entrepreneurship. She started several businesses and, and we're focused along with Olivia Thomas Thompson, our other colleague, in really looking uh, and, and addressing issues through people empowering people for inclusion now, which is Pepin. Pepin is an African-American owned, uh, woman owned research firm, recruitment firm and technology solutions company that focuses specifically on diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging. Our eyes are focused not only on the healthcare industry, but empowering underrepresented individuals so that they can have a voice in not only clinical trials, but in changing the pathway so that disparities are reduced and positive change can come from the, in, from the, from the industry. There are three pillars, uh, strategic communities, strategic uh, empowered communities, uh, empowered uh, uh, study partners, and empowered data systems. So we uh, like to just welcome uh, them and hear their story. We're going to start off uh, with uh, Deidre uh, talking about her story um, and looking a bit at the perils of pregnancy and the lack of access, especially for black and brown women. Um, and so we welcome her right now and uh, Deidre, please uh, take it away. Thank you all for the opportunity to share this information today. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I am Deirdre O'Neill, just as uh, Dr. Covington has said. I'm very excited to be here today and to share with, uh, with you guys my story. 
So I'm going to take you back to 2006. I was 21 for about six months. Um, I remember going through, you know, a rather em embarrassing, I guess, medical issue at the time, just because I was so young, didn't really understand a whole lot of things. Um, but I was, I was diagnosed with a very aggressive yeast infection. And I went to the doctors to go get checked out. They gave me a pill, which was supposed to clear up this infection within 24 to 72 hours. Went back about three weeks later for a follow-up. And it was there where I was greeted by the doctor. And she started saying, like, are you feeling okay? Are you all right? And I said, yes, I'm fine. Um, little did I know that um, she, I was asked to do a urine sample in the beginning. But little did I know that she had taken my urine sample. And after examining me, she went ahead and administered uh, a pregnancy test. She brought this pregnancy test into the room with me, but it was just a square with two little lines and she handed it to me. Now, I understand that some people may think this is just common knowledge for everybody, but um, I had never taken a pregnancy test before. Um, and most of the time I had just seen a stick. So I was not looking for a square or understanding what was going on. I was then informed at that time that I was pregnant and that, you know, I, sh I didn't really have um, a reaction. I was utterly in shock. You know, here I am following up for a yeast infection. And now you're telling me that I'm about to be a mother at 21. Um, crazy things are running through my mind, especially about how many times I've gone to the bar in the past couple of days. So it was just a couple of things that kind of definitely, uh, scared me a bit. I was then introduced to, I didn't, the doctor wasn't happy that I didn't have like this great, amazing reaction. So she sent in another young lady to schedule my abortion. And so then I'm just sitting there in silence in utter shock. So I just remember saying, I need you to excuse me for a minute. I need to go. I remember sitting in my car and thinking to myself, I don't know what to do next. So I just remember then later finding out, I went home, I talked to my mother, we figured some things out. But I remember then later finding out that the medication that was given to me to clear up this yeast infection is incredibly dangerous to pregnant women. In fact, it could have caused a miscarriage. So then I go through um, my pregnancy. So through my pregnancy, um, I learn again, I say I relearn that I am an anemic person. So I am not producing, my blood is not producing what it needs to produce uh, to help me stay where I need to be. Um, I was going through several dizzy spells through my pregnancy. I worked two jobs through my pregnancy. Um, and then as I delivered my first child, um, my doctor was not available. I was given the doctor on call. Um, a gentleman who came in and just pulled on his gloves, scooted up to me and said, okay, Let's deliver this baby. I remember turning to him and saying, I'm sorry, what's your name? Like, do you know my name? <laughs> How are you today? I'm in labor. So um, I delivered my child. However, because of the way the birth was going, um, my heart rate was dropping. My daughter's heart rate was dropping. Then throughout the process of pushing, I tore vaginally and then I hemorrhaged um, very badly afterwards. I was quickly sewn up from my tear. I was told, oh, you're a trooper. Everything's going to be fine. And then two days later, I was <clears throat> released and I was sent home to be with my daughter. I was very weak when I got home. I could barely lift up my head sometimes to get her to breastfeed her, little things like that. So of course, I later find out it's because of my anemia. I was not given additional blood after my birth. I was not given anything to help uh, my blood cells produce more blood. Um, so it is kind of a miracle that uh, she and I were okay. It's also the miracle I was still able to produce milk to feed her. And then I would like, then we're going to fast forward to my second child. I get to my second child. Um, again, I have gained a lot of weight throughout my pregnancy. I'm having dizzy spells. I'm passing out. I passed out five times with my second pregnancy. Again, I have the same doctor I had before. Towards the end of my pregnancy, she finally said, oh, you're anemic. We're going to need to administer some iron to you. So I go and get iron. That helps for a little bit. But I go through 
my birth, I mean, not through my birth, I do apologize, through my pregnancy with a lot of complications. I was weak, I was tired, um, passing out. I literally passed out on a to commuter train. And then to come to find out that doing, as I came towards the end of my second pregnancy, I was just not feeling right. I told the doctor, I said, we need to look at doing an elective induction. I think my son is ready. He needs to come. He was due October the 11th. I told her this October the 8th. She said, no, let's let things happen naturally. Let's keep it. Let's, let's just see what happened. Let's nature take its course. October 19th, I went into labor. When my son came out, he was blue. The cord was wrapped around his neck twice. He was nine pounds and he broke my tailbone and I hemorrhaged all over the hospital floor. I, my son was immediately taken from me so that they could make sure that he was okay. Um, and I was held up by three of the nurses in the room so that I could get from the bathroom, from the bed to the bathroom and from the bathroom back to the bed. Luckily, my son was okay. Luckily, I was okay. But again, I was not given any additional blood. I was not sat down, sat down or spoken to in any way. And in no way, shape or form should I at 5'3", 135 pounds, be giving birth to a nine pound, three ounce baby. So had my doctor had checked me when I talked to her on October the 8th, maybe she would have seen that the cord is wrapped around his neck twice. Maybe she would have seen that something wasn't going on with my levels. Things, uh, things of that concern. Moving on to my third child, I have now learned to speak up for myself a little bit. My third child, again, I go through my pregnancy, I'm back in the room with the, now I get iron infusions because now it's on the forefront that I am anemic. I am also RH negative. So throughout my pregnancies, I've had to get Rogam. So because if my children are RH positive, if their blood mixes with my blood, they can kill me. So my third child, now I'm saying to the doctor, I cannot have another nine pound baby. Please, I need you to understand. I cannot go through that again. Oh, you're fine, you're fine. August the 22nd, I said, please, she's ready. She needs to come. She's due August the 23rd. Please schedule my elective induction. No, Miss O'Neill, you need to let things happen naturally. I said, no, I know my body now. She's ready. She needs to come. I was ignored. I was sent home. October 27th, I mean, August 27th, I do apologize. I fell at home. I went to the hospital. I said, I'm not leaving until my daughter is delivered. This needs Something is go, something's wrong, something's not right. They finally checked me, my daughter was transverse. On August 22nd, my doctor would have seen that my daughter was transverse. She didn't check me thoroughly. Now, my voice, I'm done with her. I, do, I go to um, get a procedure where they have to turn the baby. Luckily, that was successful. However, I delivered my daughter. She is also nine pounds, three ounces. When I delivered her, she took everything inside of me with her. My body went everywhere, all over the floor. The physician had to literally stick their entire fist inside of me because they didn't know where the, blood, the bleeding was coming from. I had allowed my 10-year-old daughter to be in the room so she could see the birth of her sister. So imagine I had talked her through birth, but I did not talk her through mommy bleeding all over the floor. So then after giving birth to my third child, I went home, I was not able to stand up straight for eight weeks. So now I have a newborn, I have two children at home and I'm trying to care while I can't stand up straight. I also lost the feeling in my arms from here down until my third daughter was five months old. Go on, as I move on again to my fourth pregnancy, which was very unexpected, I went to the hospital for food poisoning. I came out finding out I had an ovarian cyst and another baby on the way. We decided with my new doctor, the doctor who had to stick her arm inside of my body to stop my hemorrhaging, that I should probably have a C-section. It's probably better for me to do that for my safety. I have a C-section. I hemorrhage again. After my fourth child, after my C-section, the doctor that delivered my, my son with my C-section, she finally came to me on my follow-up and said, Miss O'Neill, we need to talk to you seriously. Do you want to have more children? Because if you do have more children, you may not be here. 
it may come down to you deciding but whether you or the child. And that was probably the case with baby number two. That was probably the case with baby number three. It was definitely the case with baby number four. But never once was all of this information taken into account. Never once did someone stop and look at the chart and say, her anemia is so bad. She has to have iron infusions. She's RH negative. All of these things. I was naive. I was young. I didn't know that I could stand up for myself. I didn't know all of the things that I had rights to. Nowadays, we have social media. We have all these groups. We have all this information and technology around us that we can use to help each other, to be there for each other, to advocate for each other. The devices that we can put in place with, with companies like Agape and companies like Pepin and what they produce and what they put together for patients like us to be able to talk to each other, to be able to communicate, for our communication to come through the doctor and for the doctor to understand that yes, you are a physician and yes, you've gone to school, but these are people. This could be your mother. This could be your sister. This could be your cousin. And we need you just as much as like we need you and you need us. You can't find out more ways to treat us unless we tell you. And we can't find out more ways how we're supposed to be treated unless you tell us. You have to inform us. We need things in place to inform us. Somebody should have told me a long time ago about the issues that I was going to go on and suffer through. So I thank you guys for being here today. I thank you for listening to my story. And I am proud to tell you that I am a I'm proud mother of four. They are all here. They are all alive. And I take care of them every single day. In fact, they keep me going. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. That's a powerful, powerful story. And we appreciate you taking the time to share that. We wanted her to take the time to tell her full story. Uh, I have just a few things to show you. And I'm going to show you very quickly. If my slides can be shown, I'd appreciate that. Um, we have this because we want you to know and to understand that patients are at the center of everything that we should be doing, not only in terms of drug development, but also in developing devices. Uh, I, I don't have to, to, to speak or present uh, to the choir, but if you would just give me a couple of minutes, let me sing a few bars, if you will. So we know that representation is a problem. We know that generalizability, especially in work that we do from a research perspective, is important. We want to make sure um, because these studies are costly. We also know that 25% of the costs are associated with recruitment. Um, and if you're not recruiting enough people, this is a major reason that many trials fail. Uh, many people say, well, we don't know where they are. We don't know uh, how to find them. We're uncomfortable, but I submit to you that we need to find a way, not only throughout the drug development process, but also the device development process to make sure that each and every step along the way from early conception, even mechanism of action or early design throughout the entire process as to how it works in the real world, we must make sure that patients are at the center. Now, our stakeholders are talking. Uh, we, we know that there are pain points associated with this. Not only uh, the, the, those who are making uh, products are talking, those who are taking products are talking. They're saying, listen, we need to know what you're doing. Um, uh, CROs and sponsors are a clinical research organization and sponsors who are conducting the study need to understand really the planning associated with making sure that people are included in the process, those who are prescribing therapies, those who are looking at the regulatory uh, landscape, and those who are actually paying for, for drugs and for devices need to really understand um, the issue. They're, they're talking saying, show me the money. I know that uh, you're about to, 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 to sell me or, or present something to me that's expensive, but I need to make sure that it works for the patient population uh, that I deal with. And I don't think that it is because they're not included in your study. Uh, I know that we talk a lot about value-based uh, contracting and things of that nature. People are looking to say, if, if it doesn't work the way that, it, that, that you say it is, then I, I want some of my money back. Even as it relates, as you could hear from the story previously, uh, how people are, are communicating the value, not only of what they're given, but their but their healthcare condition. There needs to be an exchange so that people can understand uh, what they're getting, understand how it impacts on them. And even if you do, for example, have all of the choices uh, in front of you, you're still saying, what do I do? 
how do I choose? How do I make decisions? And so we know that the FDA and many other regulatory bodies are looking and providing guidelines that will be focused on inclusion. So I'm going to go to these next slides just very quickly. The solution indeed does focus not only on equitable access, but action. We've seen slides that look to see that people are at different levels and they may not be able to get access to services or resources. And we've tried to really level the playing field so that uh, solutions are accessible. But I submit to you that access is not only important. Yes, we want to make sure that people have the opportunity to play or be a part of the process, but even more so, we need to make sure that people are in the game and able to play action. We need access and we need actions. Um, Dr. Essien has come up with the term pharmacal equity, um, which means that we need both. And so what we propose is to really have a way and not only we're developing plans, but that we're also developing solutions. So I'm just going to go very quickly through just a case study because I really want to, you to hear uh, Tamara and, and her story as well. Um, but I wanted to give you this as a grounding to say there are ways in which as we plan, as we develop, as we think about the execution pull through that this can be done. This is a case study. Let me set this up for you so you'll know what I'll present to you in just a, a second. Uh, this is a scenario of a large pharma company that was designing a, 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 a recruit. A, a, program. They were in phase 3B. Uh, uh, it was a, 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 um, a diabetes drug, uh, but it was also an injectable device. What, what, what is it that we're trying to do? We're trying to develop not only uh, a process or plan, but really an execution strategy that focused on recruitment and retention, but made sure that we collected and we provided information and it was representative from an African-American or Latino uh, patient population. Why was this important? Developing a framework and recommendation for the company was critical that focused not only on planning, but creating the operational efficiencies and the engagement strategies so that it would be successful. The need was to develop some sort of pilot or some sort of program that not only focused not only on what we needed to do from a recruitment perspective, but added into it some decentralized data collection strategy and in, strategies and engagement tools that really helped to operationalize these processes and set KPIs in process. The goal was simple. We wanted to provide examples, solutions that not only merge technical, digital, and engagement applications in the process. So that's the context of this very a uh, brief schema uh, uh, scenario uh, schematic that I want to present to you. And the goal of this is just to say that in each and every part of this process, we included patient input. We included a way to make sure that we cannot understand effectively how this impacts patients and pa patient populations, especially diverse patient populations, unless their voice is included in the process. So just very, very briefly, um, as it related to the study design, as it related to protocols, uh, we work not only with employee resource groups, within the organization, but we did crowdsourcing. We need to make sure, does this informed consent process, for example, make sense? We're shifting from paper to e-consent. So we tested really the viability of that in the context of, of the protocol design. We looked at the technologies that were being developed in terms of not only the convenience, but how this fit into the system and workflow. All of that needed to be integrated. As it relates really to the, actually what happened, we need to make sure that our goals were set, site selection was set, our strategic priorities were set and communicated, that was a pull through directly into the engagement process in terms of not only how we were listening, how we were understanding different communities, and then really as related to actually starting uh, the program and completing it, there was monitoring. There was making sure our sites were recruiting. Uh, do they understand what the objective is? What is it that they? What happens if they're not performing? How then does the field force fit into that to make sure that pe that, that things are going according to plan and uh, an appropriate common engagement strategy. And finally, as it related to the operational efficiencies, we need to make sure that as we then look in, and, and, and put out our KPIs, that we had the budget in place, that we were able to measure effectively, that we were able to really find out what was necessary within the organization um, that integrated not only solutions, but helped really learn and grow. So we had a way of really impacting not only uh, uh, the diversity KPIs, but looking at the, the, the pull through, the application dialogue and technology. And just very quickly, uh, briefly, just as a, as a, as a finalization, um, uh, this last slide just tells us uh, that uh, it is possible. We did a satisfaction survey. We measured our KPIs. We found that not only uh, were our partners very interested in, in hearing from us and listening to us, uh, but we were they, they, they would recommend this process to others. Um, uh, it was, it, it, this was in the high 90s. It was less, less of, a, of, of a positive impact. It was 86, and I will take it. Um, people were saying that even though this is a more complex process, uh, we did 
did appreciate the, the integration of startup, um, um, looking at patient readiness and other things. The end result was it was possible. We were able to not only to, to meet our objectives, but we were able really quite frankly uh, to, to enroll two months earlier with all of the metrics that we were doing. I presented this work a couple of years ago in London, um, and I'm just very excited to show it to you now. So that's practically how it works within pharma. I'm going to now hand it off to my colleague, Tamara Allen, uh, and she's going to talk a bit more uh, about this. And so Tamara, take it away. You have the floor. Thank you, Melva. Um, and thank you, Deidre, for sharing your story as well. I think this is so important. <clears throat> We're here to talk about strategies for engagement, action, and follow-up, and technology. Um, I want to start off by talking to you about my story. Um, in 2013, I was diagnosed with uterine fibroids. At the time, I was 33 years old. Um, I had not had children. I still do not have children. Um, I was told by my physician at the time that a laparoscopic surgery would be the best way for me to get rid of the fibroids. Um, as some of you may know, um, uterine fibroids are very uh, prevalent in the African-American community. They're also um, pretty uh, genetic as well. Um, my mother had had uterine fibroids. My grandmother, I later learned, had fibroids and later had to have a hysterectomy after having eight children. Um, so there's a lot of things. There are several other members of my family that I eventually learned that also had uh, uterine fibroids, but I wasn't aware of that until I went through this, this experience. Um, so as I mentioned, my physician had told me that, um, you know, laparoscopic surgery was something that would be great for me, um, considering that my fibroids at the time were not very large. Um, the photo on the right kind of shows a little bit of how that procedure works in the device that is typically used for laparoscopic surgeries. Um, usually it's a morselating process where they actually take the tumor and they break it apart, um, which can cause... Um, other issues, but we'll, we'll kind of delve into that in a minute. I wasn't told about the fact that there was a risk for cancer. Um, I myself later found out that there was a risk for cancer. Um, when I was went home after my um, diagnoses and the doctor said, hey, this is something that you could you should consider. Um, we really think you should be aggressive in terms to making a decision because these fibroids can grow. Um, you really need to make a decision quickly. Um, you know, she didn't really go much into what the procedure was like, what kind of devices were being used. Um, also, you know, what are the long, what are the long term implications of it? Um, I did try to ask as many questions as I I understood, um, but everything was don't worry about it. You're young. You're 33. You're not going to have to worry about anything. It's not something you have to worry about. Everyone's doing it. You know, this is a big breakthrough procedure. Um, you know, it's really cutting edge. And that was really the messaging that was coming to me that I should not worry and to trust. So um, let's go down to, and in 2017, um, I ended up waiting to have my surgery. Um, the reason why I waited to have it is because at the time I had been going through um, different challenges in terms of my work. Um, I started a business, um, as many of you well may know, who, who are entrepreneurs, um, and it's never easy. <laughs> um, it's something you have to kind of, you know, unless you're coming in with a, a windfall of money, um, you're actually typically trying to, to manage your resources as much as possible. And also you're the only person that's working. So you have to typically be working all the time. There's a lot of decisions that you have to take into account. Um, also, the fact that I had noticed that the FDA had put out the report regarding the um, morselators being something that we, those individuals should be concerned about. I went to my doctor at the time and I said, did you know that the FDA put this information out? And my physician basically said, yeah, but we don't, you know, it, it's not something you have to worry about. It really isn't, you know, it's like one in 100,000 people that have issues with this. So you don't, you're not, is that it's like few and far between. Um, that was the, the messaging, the continual messaging. So when I had the surgery in 2017, it was due to the fact that I was literally um, at the precipice of dying. Um, as similar to Deidre, I actually have, an, I'm anemic. Um, I have a lot of issues um, with that. Um, and so I was having the heavy bleeding. I was having issues being able to eat. I was literally down to 119 pounds and I'm six feet tall. That is not something that is at, at all um, healthy. And so I was still working and doing everything, but I was literally bleeding out most days. And so I went to another physician who was pretty well known and he suggested that I get a myomy myectomy uh, because my tumors had grown. 
And um, when he pulled those tumors out, um, he actually showed that it was probably the size of a five month old, like I was almost five months pregnant at that point. And I had other smaller fibroids as well. Um, during that procedure, he basically just told me, you know, this is just going to be an incision. He didn't speak about devices. He didn't speak about what, what could happen. Um, just, you know, it, it'll be quick. Don't worry about it. It'll be a couple of weeks where you're out and, and you're back at it. So, um, Later on, I was having issues. Um, and in 2021, during COVID, I had to go back and I had another procedure. This time it was a laparoscopic procedure, similar to the one that you see on the right. Um, and again, no discussions about what were my risk for cancer, even though I've always expressed that my family uh, has a history of cancer, nothing about that. Don't worry about it. You're young. Just the same message over and over and over again. Um, now let's pivot to this year. Earlier this year, I went to actually have a, uh, a pelvic exam. And um, I also decided that because a friend of mine had taken a test that her, because her mother had died from breast cancer, that I would take a test that would allow for me to know whether or not, what, what were my risks for truly getting cancer. Um, so I was diagnosed with the BRCA2 gene, which then led me during that same exam, they found out that I had uterine fibroids again. This time I have about seven of them that they need to address. But my next thing is I have to make a choice between a myectomy, a hysterectomy or a mastectomy. And so those are a lot of choices, but the different, the, the same thing came into account. This is the procedure that you can have. We can go in and we can use a laparoscopic tool. The challenge with this tool is that now since since the beginning when the announcement came out about this this procedure, one in 225 women can get uterine, uterine sarcoma cancer from this procedure. And so I was not made aware of that until I started to do my own research. There was no communication. And so the FDA did a great has done a great job of continuing to put out information. But if I was not someone who was you know, uh, you know, someone who would go and look into these things on my own, I was not getting the information. I wasn't getting communication. I didn't know anything about the device or anything and still don't know to this day, uh, only the information I have. So I want to, if you can go to the next slide, thank you. I want to speak more to why is it important to engage at every touch point? As we know that this is the process that traditionally is, is held for the device for any development of a product or a design of a device. Um, and it's so important that you think about the patient and having them engaged at every moment. Because what was missed during my experience was there was no patient-centered com communication. I didn't have information to make informed consent. There was no real access to, to the data other than what I was able to give to myself. There was no consideration of genetic con of gen my genetics. There was no concern for my long-term care and there was no true engagement in my and to help me to make proper decisions and understanding that I also was a, a, a business owner who was limited in terms of my resources. So there's a lot of things that when you're developing devices and you're thinking about how you are producing things, just as Deidre stated, there is a need for us to engage. Melva also touched upon this. There's a need to engage every process because our bodies as humans evolve, just as technologies we see evolve but we have to treat them together. They can't be absent from one another. And there cannot be an assumption of trust also. So here are some of the things that you can consider doing. Um, we have engagement. There's a lot of ways to engage in, in terms of the communities. You know, getting into crucial conversations, involving the patients in really the early development process, and so you can understand their unmet needs and the preferences for the device design and usability and functionality of that, and implementing ways that you can get real information through pilot programs and testing as well. Melba, you can put up the other. Um, thank you so much. Um, as well, so there there needs to be a co-creation of these of these tools. So offering co-creation workshops where patients and engineers and clinicians can collaborate on device development and pursuing central design processes. And also getting putting out reports and, and sharing those successes and the cases and also providing places where people can speak to one another, not just things that they create, but what you create in, in terms of showing that you're caring for them 
Show that you care by creating opportunities for them to engage because it cannot be disconnected. As a, as a patient and someone who is currently now in the industry, it is I am seeing more and more often that there is a complete disconnect that I, we operate too much in silos. And unfortunately, there is an important, it is a very important that we think about that everyone is not the same. And so we have to treat individuals as individuals and work together to, to learn from each other. So um, I wanted to show you a few things that um, these are two case studies that Melva and had, Melva and I actually worked together on one of these um, for fearless, fearless African Americans. Um, I'm sorry, my apologies. Fearless African Americans connected and powered for diabetes. This is uh, Lily. Um, we had this um, engagement with a very well-known neo-soul artist, um, and she was our ambassador for this campaign. We worked together to um, share information out to communities and actually go into communities and work in partnership with communities to advocate, to educate, um, and provide information that was needed. Like, how can you take care of yourselves? And, and they also were not absent from the actual company that's the farmer brand. So that was the most important thing is that they were able to see that this company cares for me. They're going to give me live cooking de demonstrations. They're going to show me how to take care of my health. They're going to provide talks and wellness workshops. They're not just coming to take from me. They're going to give to me as well. And they're going to actually take a the time and resources to invest. Another more recent uh, activation was with a Players Alliance and Pull Up Neighbor Tour. This was done in con connectivity with the Major League Baseball Association and the Players Alliance. So uh, several African Americans and Latino um, baseball players got together. They put together a pot of money, and the uh, Major League Baseball Association also uh, partnered with them as well. And we produced a 33 city pandemic tour where we went directly to underrepresented communities. Through this activation, we were able to give food, PPE, baseball equipment, and we reached over two, uh, over a half a million people with this activation. And what we also learned from this is that in partnership with the community, we were able to learn so much about the needs of these very, very rural areas where people don't typically see any support um, and, and impoverished communities. So the, there are ways to go about this. And I think that it's so important that we think about that from the perspective of what is what is it that we can do? We can't be operate in fear. You know, we are human beings. If we create something, we're creating it for a purpose. But who are we aligning with to help, you know, to help ourselves and help uh, to, to put this forth? So we can't forget the human in the process. Uh, thank you so much. And I will be here to take questions later. Well, as we wrap up, we, we just have a few key takeaways. I'm not going to read everything on this screen, but just to say uh, uh, that we are focused on and making sure not only that you know individuals within the communities, but they know who you are as well. And so establish yourself as an organization and your reputation. Let them understand what your corporate mission is as it relates to DEI and other kinds of health equity. If you don't have it, it's a good time to get it. Um, make sure that the past experiences, especially at relative to healthcare, are acknowledged knowledge. As you not only seek data, uh, understand that the questions that you ask are relevant, seek contacts, seek representatives in the community. Are you listening effectively, empathically, and in an engaged way? And then when interpreting the results, to make sure that people are a part of the process and that they're even in part of the dissemination strategy. And so listen, we have three just major takeaways as we as we wrap this up. Uh, everything is everything matters as it relates to what we're talking about. Uh, building and establish trust relationships. That should be at the center of everything you can do as you do. Uh, approach your research and your strategic planning using a team of experts, especially those in the community that are focused on addressing disparities and inclusion, as well as empowerment, and achieve solutions in an integrated and iterative manner. So that not only the research partnership and technologies is, is fused together, but the way that you impact change through engagement outcomes and reducing costs is as well. And so uh, we thank you. Uh, thank you for my partners um, in presentation and in, and in business. Thank you for uh, uh, Kurt and MDIC and all of the, all of the team. Uh, we hope this has been helpful. And um, open it up, happy to answer any questions or comments. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much.
Well, good day to everyone uh, that's here. My name is Dell Smith, and I have the pleasure of serving as the co-founder and CEO of Acclinate. And just really excited to share some thoughts with you today. Really, what I hope to be some very specific strategies as it relates to DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion in clinical trials. And we know the focus here for MDIC is on medical devices. And so I appreciate the opportunity to lean into the experience that uh, I've had and our company has had over the years doing this type of work primarily within the pharma space, but wanting to share some strategies with you that we know work really well within uh, the space of medical devices as well, too. So um, Kurt was very specific about saying, Dale, make sure you share some takeaways that people can uh, go back into their companies and their organizations and actually utilize in order to address some of these issues as it relates to DEI and diversity. And so that's the mandate, and we're going to make sure we stick with it. So we can get our slides queued up, and we'll go through and spend some time. And I'm really excited also about the questions and answers period that we have here. So my understanding is that if you have questions along the way, uh, please put them in the chat. That's where we're going to get, I think, the best and most in-depth uh, discussion is from your questions. And I look forward to that. And we'll make sure we save time for those questions towards the end. So with that being said, let's get into it. Um, just a little bit more in terms of context uh, about Acclinate, our expertise centers around accessing, engaging, and mobilizing communities of color so they can make informed decisions about clinical trial participation. And what you see here on the slide uh, are some of our team members. And what I really want to point out is just the diversity and the lived experiences that our team members bring to the table when it comes to these issues. I'm not here to sell you on Acclinate, but what I'm here to do is to let you know, for example, that... Uh, this work is so important in order to really do it well, while I'm going to talk to you about strategies, at the end of the day, it really comes back to the people that are putting those strategies together and executing those strategies. So I encourage you to look around your teams within your companies and your organizations and to see, do you have that type of diversity as well, too, with your teams that are trying to put together these strategies for diversity, equity, and inclusion? Now, we know there's various different um, reasons why this topic may be of importance to you. There, there may be importance to you from a, a moral imperative, uh, an issue of health equity and wanting to ensure that uh, your devices, when they get to the market, uh, have efficacy and safety and, and work the same for as many groups and populations as possible. For some of you, the imperative here is around a scientific one, right? Wanting to really make sure that that data and that device is working the way that it is planned for use to work and gets the outcomes and the endpoints that is expected. Others are very much interested in, to, in this topic of diversity, equity, inclusion from a, uh, a reference point of a regulatory uh, compliance standpoint. Uh, and that's nothing to, I think, shy away from because as you can see from the screen here, there is a regulatory imperative for ensuring that there is adequate DEI considerations for your medical device trials. And so I wanted to share a little bit of the insight into the most recent guidance from the FDA as it relates to this topic. And as you can see here, that guidance was released back in April of last year, and it was entitled Diversity Plans to Improve Enrollment of Participants from Underrepresented Racial and Ethnic Populations in Clinical Trials. We know that this wasn't the first set of guidance that the FDA issued around this issue of diversity, uh, but it is the most recent and it is the one that's getting the most attention. Um, and to go along with this guidance, of course, we know that there was legislation and uh, that was put through in the Fedora Act, the Omnibus uh, Bill that passed in December of last year that, that provided a, a, a requirement for the FDA to be able to um, receive these diversity plans for clinical trials. And again, a lot of people think about this as being for pharma and for pharmaceuticals only, but if you read through the guidance and many of you on this call know, this applies to both uh, pharmaceuticals as well as medical devices. And so if you'll take a look at what's on the left-hand side of the screen here, I think it's important to really spell out uh, some very specific aspects of this guidance from the FDA so that we're, we're, we know what is being asked of us as we move forward. And it says that sponsors 
will describe in detail the operational measures that will be implemented to enroll and retain underrepresented racial and ethnic participants in their planned trials or studies, and the planned use of data to characterize safety, efficacy, and optimal dosage in these part participants when applicable. Now, you see that there's a focus on underrepresented, underrepresented racial and ethnic populations here. And the topic of this conversation is really about DEI. Now, I, before I go into the other two points, I do want to come back to that. And it's the reality that um, diversity, equity, inclusion is a very broad umbrella. And in an ideal world, what we're saying is that we want to be inclusive of as many different groups and as many different populations as we possibly can when we conduct our trials and studies. And that may be age, that may be gender, uh, that could be um, sexual orientation, that could be even weight, uh, particularly as we start thinking about how this applies in the space of medical devices. But when I'm talking to you today, I'm talking to you specifically with a lens on addressing DEI in the context of underrepresented racial and ethnic minorities. Now, what you'll find is that many of the things that we talk about and the strategies are going to be very applicable for other groups and other characteristics uh, that you want to do in order to make sure that you get an adequate level of diversity, equity, and inclusion in your studies. But uh, I tell people this, the FDA guidance and the title on this draft is very specific. And while within the guidance themselves, they talk about the importance of other aspects of diversity, I want people to understand the message is loud and clear from FDA that as it relates to underrepresented racial and ethnic populations, this is a high priority and this is something that has to be addressed. And so let's not lose sight of the larger picture of wanting to expand the DEI uh, conversation into other groups. That's great to have. But when it comes to the specific strategies that you must do to employ from a regulatory standpoint, uh, this is one that we really want to lean into for our time here today. Now, getting to our second aspect of the recent draft guidance, it says, describe specific trial enrollment and retention strategies, including but not limiting, limited to site location and access, sustained community engagement, and reducing, reducing burdens due to trial, study design, or conduct. So we're going to talk about this issue of site location. We're going to talk about sustained community engagement and this idea about reducing burdens when it comes to your actual clinical trial. And then finally, for this guidance here, it says describe measures to ensure that diverse participants, I'm sorry, that, that diverse participant enrollment goals are achieved and specify actions to be implemented during the conduct of the trial or studies if planned enrollment goals are not met. A really big issue here. I love what I was hearing from the previous session that talked about goals and data and tracking. And that is an aspect of the diversity plans that the FDA is saying that sponsors need to do. So um, let's continue to move forward and dig into this in a little bit more detail. You may be asking, why is this issue of diversity such a big uh, topic right now, both from a regulatory and a scientific and a moral imperative? And, you know, I will point to this article here from uh, Fierce Biotech that 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 really has spotlighted, uh, put a spotlight on an IQVIA article um, that was earlier in this year that said that clinical trial diversity it, it is at its lowest level in 10 years, lowest level in 10 years. Now, much of this report looked at uh, pharmaceuticals, but if you look at related data as it relates to medical device um, participation, you'll find that you would kind of draw a very similar conclusion and that while our U.S. population, if this is the lens we're looking at, is getting more diverse, and right now, according to the latest Census Bureau, we're about 42% uh, makeup of racial and ethnic minorities in the United States, we know that clinical trial participation uh, has, has flatlined. In many cases, it's, it's around 5% when we look at racial and ethnic populations for clinical trials, whether it be medical device or pharma. Um, and in some instances, uh, it's actually decreased. And so that's where the imperative is coming from. Now, this is an interesting um, chart because, uh, or diagram, and I like this because if you look at this, it looks very similar. At the top, it says, who wants change? And everybody raises their hand. And on the bottom, it says, who wants to change? And of course, we can see no hands are up. 
I, I wanted to lead into our discussions about strategies and changes that need to be made in order to be able to get to better outcomes by highlighting this because this is this is really what we kind of see happening right now and a lot of uh, sponsors in the industry like they want to see the numbers change they want to see improvement but when it comes to making modifications to uh, processes making modifications to budgets to investments uh, there's not as much of a tendency for people to be as eager to lean in and say, yes, we want we want to make this change. So just keep that in mind, because I believe that people that are on this call do want to raise their hand for change uh, and also want to make the change. So let's figure out how we can best do that here. You heard Trust talk about a lot in the previous sessions, and I want to to, to lean into that and double down on this topic of trust. Because if we talk about barriers to diversity, equity, inclusion, and trials, some of these barriers will center around logistics, access issues, right? But some of these uh, barriers will center around people's willingness to um, be part of clinical research and a trust that they have in order to be part of the clinical research process. We don't have enough time to go through all the historical and even, unfortunately, um, 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 recent periods of uh, mistrust and uh, and situations that have taken place that have created this type of environment, particularly for our communities of color. But suffice to say, there is a significant level of mistrust or distrust in our communities of color when it comes to clinical trials. So this slide talks about what is the definition of trust, because we use that term a lot. And if we kind of put on the, the academic um, uh, hat here, um, we would define trust as the willingness of a party to be vulnerable to the actions of another party. Again, the willingness of a party to be vulnerable to the actions of another party and the expectation that the other will perform an action important to the person, the truster, regardless of the ability to monitor or control that other person. So in the uh, in a situation where you can control and you can monitor everything, there's really not a need for trust because the data and your systems are going to allow you to know when there's been a violation or somebody hasn't kept their word. But in the case of clinical trials, as we know, the person that's taking part in those trials um, really doesn't have that opportunity to be able to, to, to monitor these things as much. So um, definition of trust very much applies here when it comes to clinical trials. So to lean in a little bit more, I want to give you some greater context on this. And there, so there's different types of trust. We've, we've got uh, what we call cognitive trust, and this is the trust that we have for someone's ability to perform. It's more um, related to skills, but we also have this element of affective trust, which is related to feelings or emotions. And the example I give sometimes is you know, in the early days of COVID, I actually contracted COVID and went to New York City before they even knew it was really an issue, a hot spot, and I came back and I was sick for like 10 days. And I made an appointment to my doctor and my doctor saw me for about 10 minutes, ran through a whole litany of things that could be, had me do follow-up tests and sent me home with some medicine. Well, that same day I talked to my grandmother who I affectionately call Big Mama. And I said, you know, Big Mama, I'm not feeling well. And Big Mama said, put some Vicks on your chest, wrap up in a blanket, turn the heater on and sweat it out. And I remember at that point in time thinking to myself, listen, my doctor has had like 12, 14 plus years of schooling. My grandmother didn't finish the seventh grade. My doctor saw me for 10 minutes and probably didn't think much about me after I left. My grandmother loves me, would never want to see me harmed, and is probably worried about me right now. And that illustrates the difference between cognitive and affective trust. So the message I want to send to you and what you see on this slide here is what we found through data is that... Um, until the level of affect of trust gets to a certain point with individuals, particularly for communities of color or people who are traditionally been um, underrepresented in trials, that they are not going to be ready to participate. They're not going to participate and they're not going to be retained in the study, even if you get them to say yes and participate. So there's an element of this here of, of having to work to increase affect of trust in people, and then the question becomes, how do you increase affect of trust versus cognitive trust, right? The industry approach for cognitive trust is, let me give you this pamphlet. Let me give you this information. Let me explain the informed consent to me. Let me explain how the process works for the trial. And we think that we're moving people to a point of decision where they're saying, okay, I'm ready to take part in the study because you've explained things to me and I, I now have a cognitive understanding. 
But we have to really understand that it's really the affect development. We know the saying, people need to know how much you care before they know how much you know. And so what I want to leave with you, if I leave you with anything, is this understanding that your strategies need to not only try to get to the cognitive understanding of how your study or your trial works, but it also needs to get to the emotional aspects of ha having people feel safe, that they're in a place where people care about them, want to see no harm, and will do everything to try to protect them. So there's different ways to do that. Um, but uh, the best way I can tell you is sustained community engagement. You saw that in the FDA guidance. There's a reason it was in the guidance. That's because in order to build affect of trust, people need to see over time that you're doing things to watch out for their safety and their well-being, even when it means that it may not be in their best interest. It's them making a decision that they're making this because it's in your best interest. So when we kind of scoop into communities and we scoop into reach out to participants and we're like, hey, you don't know me, but would you like to be part of my trial, or my study? And then we question why there's a hesitation is because we haven't built enough affect of trust through a level of sustained engagement with them in order to build that to a certain level. And so that's really, really important to do that. And if anybody wants to know about more specific strategies about how to do that, more than happy to talk to you uh, as well in the process. And so as we can get to, um, I've got a couple more slides here before we get to some, some questions and answers period. Um, I also wanted to think about this in terms of people's willingness and ability. And so I like two by twos because I think they explain a lot in the world. But uh, what this is saying is that for our underrepresented racial and ethnic communities, what we know is that people fall into one of four different categories. They are either willing and able, which means that they, are, they have a certain level of trust and they have the ability to participate in your research. And this is where current recruitment and retention methods fall on, right? They go out there and they find people who are logistically able to take part in the studies and that are raising their hand to be part. But we know if we just focus on that box, we leave out um, a lot of our communities of color and our underrepresented racial and ethnic communities because they're not quite willing yet. So if you go to the box to the right, you'll see you have a group of people who are willing but unable. And this is where the logistical barriers, they're, they're saying, listen, if there was a study that was available that was close to me, uh, that didn't require me to take too much time off work, that maybe could even uh, compensate me for my, my time and or my gas and my parking, I will be willing to take part in that study. And so I think there's opportunities here to focus on logistical barriers and how you can decrease those for people because they're willing. They just need some addressing of those logistical barriers to be part. I'll go to the bottom right first before we end up on the left-hand side. On the bottom right, you have people who are unwilling and unable. These are people that have logistical barriers and they're saying to you, hey, no, you're not going to get me to be part of a trial. And I don't want to say that you write those people off. But what I, what I do want to say to you is that if you understand that you have a group of people that are in this category, um, I would encourage you to think about how you may be able to develop strategies to move people in the other categories first, because they're going to probably have a higher propensity and probability of doing that which leads me to the last box, people who are unwilling but able. And I think that this is the group or the category that provides the most opportunities for those that want to increase their DEI uh, outcomes for the trials. And these are individuals who are able to participate, but have not reached adequate levels of trust to be willing to participate. So logistically, they can make it happen, but they don't have a certain level of trust and this is where you can use the sustained engagement, the affective and cognitive trust combination to get them to move to that willing and able category. And I will tell you, I think if you're able to focus on that group, you'll see significant outcomes when it, when it, uh, when it comes to DEI efforts. Last slide. I know this is very, very busy. And again, I want to encourage anyone who wants to talk afterwards, or hopefully we'll have the opportunity to share these slides with you, that over the four years that we've been doing this work, we have actually developed a pretty sophisticated model about how to get the maximum outcomes for DEI efforts for research and clinical trials. And I'll talk about this in kind of four main categories here and I'll tell you what the sub items are between uh, underneath these. But first and foremost, it needs to start prior to your first person in for your study. Okay. If that's when you're starting, you're already starting too late because building affect of trust, as you saw on the earlier slide, takes some time. And um, just starting to do that when you first open up your trial and your study, thinking you're gonna have reached that is not feasible. So what you wanna do is you wanna have this pre-engagement period 
And we typically like to say this pre-engagement period is, is starting about six months before your, your trial actually opens up for recruitment. And this is where you're reviewing your existing practices. This is where you're creating this digital engagement platforms and you're making sure that your data and your technology is, is uh, ready to go, as you heard in your previous session. You're actually establishing baselines of understanding about like how do participants view your study, how what are their thoughts or concerns. You're doing focus groups with potential participants or patients who would be utilizing your device for your study. And then you're actually looking at, you're actually putting together digital engagement toolkits. If, if you want to try to reach people digitally, you're putting all these things together, of course, not just for an IRB approval, but you're putting them together to be able to test and validate that they're sending the right message across that you want to do. And then if you move to the engagement period, the engagement period, which typically we like to say to our clients is somewhere around three months before your, your study begins. This is when you're really taking a really close look at your, your IE criteria, making sure that your IE criteria is not creating levels of bias that would be of concern to you. You're looking at your patient data. You're analyzing your epidemiology data as it exists. You're looking at your sites and you're saying to your sites and you're, and you're, you're engaging with your sites to say, you know, what is your potential or your opportunity for to actually engage in communities that are underrepresented for my particular study? You're also identifying individuals in your community that might actually act as like ambassadors or activation points is what we call them. People that are going to be ready to evangelize and talk about how important it is to be part of your study. And then you want to actually make sure that all of your communication is culturally relevant um, and doesn't create bias. And if anything, it actually uh, understands the nuances that exist in your communities that you're trying to engage with when it comes to education and awareness. Now your trial starts, and this is when you're recruiting and retaining your trials. And again, you want to act, you want to leverage what we call activation points or ambassadors in your communities, and you want to leverage this digital technology to present your trial to um, to those that are willing and able, and also to present your trial to those that may be unwilling but able to be part of your study. You want to periodically review those engagements, recruitment, and retention strategies. You want to see if there are any issues that participants are having in terms of logistical barriers or concerns about being part of your study. And then if necessary, we know this is not the easiest thing to do, you may want to look at a modification of your protocol based upon that preliminary data that you're getting. I can't tell you how many times we get to a, a rescue study situation with clients where they're just a few months from the study ending, and now there's a discussion about making these type of changes at the very end. And uh, as we know, a lot of times that doesn't work out ideally when you don't have enough runway to be able to effectively implement new strategies in the process. And then this, this, sec this last part here, I should say, is the post-study. We talk about this a lot. Like, how do you show appreciation for people who have gone through the process of being in your study. And we just don't see as many sponsors doing that as much. Once they get their data, they're like, we got our data and they're running off to get it analyzed and to get it submitted. But we think this is very important to have an opportunity to thank your participants uh, for the study and to let them know that the study is completed. Uh, we think there's an opportunity also to survey people um, and, and to understand what their experience was like. And this may be a separate group from the people that are assessing the data that you need for your study, but a separate group that can see, like, like what can we learn to, that if we we're going to do this again, we may actually improve in the process. I talk about that as the same engagement. It's, it's one thing to say, thanks a lot for being part of our study. Bye. It's another opportunity for you to potentially say, listen, um, you still are suffering from this indication or this condition. Uh, here are other resources that may be able to um, provide value to you along the way. And so, again, it gets to a point where it's not transactional at that point. It becomes relational. And then, of course, uh, doing the appropriate uh, debriefs within your team internally to try to understand um, if we were going to do this again, how would we improve? And so, again, just to highlight what I'm showing you here is this idea of start early with pre-engagement. There's specific things that you can do in the process. Right before your trial starts, there are specific things that you can do in order to make sure that you validate it and you're ready to go. During your actual recruitment and retention process, there's ways for you to evaluate the effectiveness and to potentially make modifications along the way. If you see that it's not going the way that you want it to go and it needs to go in terms of outcomes, DEI outcomes. And then after the study is done, the opportunity to um, provide appreciation to those that took part and to be able to see if there's ways that you can learn so that the next time around you can improve. So 
Uh, that was a lot, but again, I will be more than happy to to share that, that slide or the, the MDIC can share that slide as well. And I know we just have a couple minutes, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions that may have as a result of the uh, the presentation. All right, I see a question here that says perspectives on AI and centralized uh, and clinical trials and impact on DEI. Uh, AI is huge buzzword. And, you know, at the end of the day, and a matter of fact, we just put an article out on this today, an opinion piece that talked about the fact that AI has significant promise when it comes to moving um, uh, the data points uh, on DEI outcomes, both from a standpoint of aiding in site selection, uh, from a standpoint of understanding, looking at electronic medical records data and seeing who may be the um, um, uh, more likely to participate from underrepresented groups. Uh, but there's also, I think, an opportunity for us to think about AI in terms of our ability to build trust. And one of the ways that we're using AI is to actually utilize it to build affect of trust with our community by understanding the areas that are of concern to them and how we can put information and engage with them in ways that builds trust. And so, but let's not lose fact, lose track of the fact that we are talking about people. So no matter how sophisticated the data is, it still comes back to people. What do you recommend from a, a physician's perspective on the issues of keeping patients informed and included in all key decisions related to their health and clinical trials? It's a good question. I know we're getting low on time here. So I, I will just say this. Uh, I'm not an expert when it comes to um, uh, physicians and wanting to provide recommendations about what physicians should do during the actual trial. But I think the best approach that we've seen from sponsors is when they bring in the PIs and the physicians in the process and help them understand what they're trying to accomplish from a DEI perspective and to hear their concerns and get their buy-in, it makes the entire process work well. So there's nothing worse than having a set of culturally relevant communication that when it gets in front of the physician or the PI, they're not following that or they're not understanding how important it is. So I believe that they should be brought into the process as early as possible and be included in that as well too. So I know we're, we're at time and so I appreciate it. It looks like we don't have any other questions, but thanks for your time. And I'm um, so excited to hear the rest of the MDIC uh, summit and the panelists as well, too. So I hope you have a great day. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to the Medical Device Innovation Consortium for including the Food and Drug Administration in this. And I'm honored to be joining the other speakers who've been sharing their expertise and insights about the value of partnering with patients. Uh, I have been involved uh, for over 20 years in my career in med tech innovation and evaluation and have had the opportunity to work from an FDA vantage point as well as in the uh, industry startup environment and even earlier stage innovation and academic environment and have worked with innovators, clinicians, research community, and increasingly patients and patient organizations where all of these stakeholders are putting our heads together to try to figure out the best strategy to generate the evidence that's necessary to advance beneficial technologies, to save lives, to uh, provide meaningful improvements in quality of life for the patients that need them most. So today I'll be speaking with you a little bit about why patient engagement and partnerships with patients are important to the FDA what we at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health have been doing to advance those approaches and discuss a little bit about our uh, new pilot uh, that's meant to integrate and advance these further to, to advance med tech innovation. So FDA has long recognized that patients have unique perspectives and points of view and expertise in living with their conditions and that benefits all of us when we uh, make sure that they have a seat at the table and their voices are heard. Uh, but over the last 10 to 15 years, um, as uh, there have been broader trends across the healthcare ecosystem to expand the ways in which we engage patients, we've been actively looking for ways to elevate that voice of the patient, to elevate it to the highest levels of advisory input that the agency considers and our most important decisions, and to elevate it from anecdote to evidence. Um, and during that time, we've also recognized that we have a ways to go, as many of the other speakers today have uh, indicated, to advance diversity in clinical research, in product development, and ultimately to advance health equity in clinical outcomes. 
And so our vision statement really emphasizes how important it is that we put patients first and that we consider how the work that we do benefits all patients. Our vision is that patients in the U.S. shall have access to high quality, safe and effective medical devices of public health importance first in the world. And so at CDRH, over a 10 plus year journey to incorporate the patient perspective, we sought to do so and to do it directly um, to impact our work. And there are many ways to do this, ranging from patient engagement, the inclusion of patient reported outcomes as endpoints in clinical studies, to look at patient preference studies to generate quantitative information that tells us about how patients look at the different benefits and risks that different options uh, may provide, as well as patient-generated health data, which refers to things that may be digitalized uh, collection of patient perspectives, whether they're coming from sensors, from registries, or other forms of data that we consider in all of our decision-making. We've issued policies uh, that have aimed to encourage industry and other stakeholders to include these approaches in their development work and in the evidence that they generate and provide to the agency, and to include examples that are meant to illustrate how we take this information, this data, this evidence, and incorporate it into FDA decision making. We've also, in the patient engagement realm, uh, developed and built out partnerships with leaders in the patient community, as well as patient organizations through our patient engagement advisory committee and our patient and caregiver connection. And we leverage both of these partnerships to advance patient-focused innovation and safety across all of our product areas and the total product life cycle. For patient science, whether it's patient reported outcomes, patient preferences, or patient generated health data, we've conducted a whole portfolio of projects uh, that are patient centered and have focused on questions and relevance to diverse populations across a whole host of conditions and disease areas that you can see here. And the aim here is to generate evidence that uh, can be broadly used by industry, patient groups, or others who are working in these spaces and to demonstrate how these methods can be applied to do so in other uh, more customized uh, studies that sponsors may conduct on their own. And so I've given you a quick tour of the work that we've done in the initiatives around patient science and engagement. But meanwhile at CDRH, there have been other strategic efforts that have been going on alongside this journey to uh, understand and take advantage of and leverage the capabilities that we have in the digital space to work with stakeholders, including patients, but also with clinicians and payers to modernize our manufacturing and quality approaches, to uh, understand how we can build out a more resilient supply chain. And internally, we've been doing a lot of work to tune up the efficiency of our interactions and our feedback uh, and have uh, been uh, able to consistently deliver an ability to do what we call regulatory sprints and provide very active um, and interactive feedback to companies. And so our new pilot, the Total Product Lifecycle Advisory Program, or TAP pilot, really is in many ways a culmination and integration of all of these initiatives and a building out of uh, services and consultative advisory capabilities to be able to work with innovators uh, toward our common goal, which is really to accelerate the pace of beneficial innovations getting to patients and to think about not only what is needed in terms of evidence uh, to get to through these different stages, uh, not only to get the regulatory green light, but also to move through payer, clinician, and patient adoption, and ultimately reach our goal of patient access to high quality, innovative, safe, and effective medical devices. This pilot focuses on uh, devices uh, that are uh, considered breakthrough. And what this means for FDA is the focus on products that provide for more effective treatment or diagnosis of life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating diseases or conditions. We recently revised this guidance uh, and released it in September, on September 15th of this year to make sure that uh, folks are aware that this does apply to devices that promote health equity and address healthcare disparity gaps and can also include certain devices uh, or medical products that are non-addictive and are used to treat pain or addiction. 
So devices which are considered breakthrough in, in these ca categories can be uh, considered for uh, participation in the TAP pilot. One of the key features, a consultative service that we have built out as part of the TAP pilot, um, is around early engagement around the development strategy. And so certainly this can include elements of the regulatory strategy as indicated here, but also goes farther than that and incorporates uh, relationships and expertise that our, our teams have been building out uh, with other stakeholders. So this might include consideration about a, a strategy for engaging with payers around coding coverage and payment to identify risks that may be associated with that strategy, to think about a strategy for engaging with professional uh, clinical societies and what type of evidence may be needed there. This is a list of the collaborators that we have to date uh, signed on to participate in the TAP pilot. We have a pipeline of organizations that have expressed interest that we are in conversation with now. And if your organization or you're aware of any that you think would be a good fit for this, please do share that information uh, with the FDA. Uh, the patient engagement component of the TAP pilot really focuses on those key pain points or opportunities in the development strategy, the business strategy, where patient input could really move the needle. And certainly for studies, uh, for devices that need a clinical study, there are many opportunities. And these are characterized in our patient engagement guidance regarding uh, involvement of patient advisors in clinical studies. As has been alluded to by many of the other speakers today, we've seen many benefits in terms of faster recruitment, enrollment, and overall study completion, more diverse participation, fewer protocol revisions, and uh, fewer protocol violations or deviations, which can result in not only faster studies, but better quality data, and ultimately more relevant data on outcomes that matter to patients. Uh, there are many other areas beyond the clinical study where patient input could be valuable, um, as indicated here, and certainly increasingly with the kinds of modern technology that we're seeing more and more at the agency, human-centered design, uh, and other opportunities to incorporate patient perspectives on how these technologies would fit into their daily use in environments outside of the clinic become increasingly important to consider. So, uh, you know, just a few takeaways uh, for anyone who's listening who is interested in thinking about how these patient uh, engagement approaches could be useful. Take a look at the FDA and MDIC websites for resources to learn more about the why, when, and how for doing so. Um, if you do have technologies that are in the breakthrough space, uh, consider whether the benefits of the TAP program could help strengthen your business strategy. Uh, and stay tuned for uh, future expansions in scope of this pilot beyond FY25. And with that, I will take any questions and thank you for your attention. I see we have a question about uh, the extent to which uh, collaborations may include other geographies. So we certainly recognize that many innovators are looking certainly at uh, uh, what the evidence needs may be in the business strategy for, for entering the U.S. market uh, for commercializing here in the United States, uh, and that is certainly the purview of the FDA, but we also recognize that many uh, companies have as part of their overall business strategy to, you know, consider what might be needed in, in other geographies. Uh, and we do have at the FDA a lot of collaborations with regulators across uh, the globe. Uh, and so we do aim to harmonize where possible in those engagements. And if any company has uh, a global uh, commercialization strategy that they would like to discuss through the TAP program, uh, just for, for that engagement with the FDA and any advice or, or connections we may be able to make to those re relevant activities, we could certainly uh, have that conversation through those engagements. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, again, very honored to participate, and thank you to the Medical Device Innovation Consortium for convening this summit. Have a wonderful afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Captain Raquel Peet. I'm director for the Office of Orthopedic Devices, as well as the co-lead for Strategic Priority 3, which is Advanced Health Equity 
here in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health and the Food and Drug Administration. Today, I'm going to talk a bit about my strategic priorities, which is advanced health equity. Primarily, I'm going to give you an agency in initiatives as well as focus on CDRA strategic priority advanced health equity. And then I'll give an example of landscape analysis of diversities in orthopedic device clinical trials. So as we move forward, I won't necessarily spend a lot of time because I do know that Dr. Dell Smith gave a lot of information regarding FDA guidance documents. So I'll really just give you some high level, but I think it's important for us to make sure that we're on the same page. So over the past few years, we have increasingly heard the term health equity echoed in many chambers. However, its use has often been used interchangeably with other terms. I hope you will indulge me in a little bit as I define some terms. And please note that I will be sharing definitions throughout this talk to ensure we all have a common understanding as we move forward in our discussion. Using the definition from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, health equity is the state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health. A related term, but not synonymous, is health disparity. It is often the metric by which we measure progress towards health equity. It is preventable differences in the burden of disease or opportunities to achieve optimal health. In the United States, conversation around health equity and health disparities have revolved around factors like race, ethnicity, sex, age, and geography, as well as other characteristics. There are many examples of notable disparities associated with these characteristics, whether it be overall life expectancy, chronic health conditions like high blood pressure, cancer, diabetes, or reproductive outcomes like infant mortality. We have often observed worse health outcomes in racial and ethnic minorities and those living in rural settings. These poor healthcare outcomes are tragedies for individuals, families, and for society as a whole. It is often asserted that social determinants of health impact a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes. Social determinants of health are the conditions in the environment where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affects a wide array of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risk. However, these variables are often difficult to measure, may impart their impacts over protracted periods of time, and may have interactions with each other as well as other factors. Hence, it is challenging to measure or account for all of these effects in a clinical study that is designed to evaluate the safety and effectiveness of investigational medical products. Instead, many have attempted to use other groups such as race, ethnicity, and ancestry to often imperfectly collection information on social determinants of health. To be clear, race and ethnicity are sociocultural defined terms, meaning they're not defined based on biology, genetics, or anthropology. Their definitions and resultant categories vary within the United States and across the globe and depend on who is reporting the assignment of race and ethnicity. Many might assert that gender and geography are subject to similar characteristics and challenges. Now, one of the things that I wanted to put forward is a personal experience. Um, typically, I get my care at Walter Reed, which is a medical center. And within that particular center, oftentimes when we're having care, it is usually self-reported, not by the individual, but often by the healthcare provider. And that may also have difficulty in us assessing what the ethnicity of a person is. Now here in the FDA, we've issued final guidance documents to help define what is meant by the term race, ethnicity, sex, and age, and has shared standard approaches to collecting this information. Dr. Dale Smith alluded to this particular guidance documents that we have, 
And these standardized approaches are critically important to ensure consistency and transparency when communicating the results of FDA clinical trials. The guidance document on the collection and reporting of race and ethnicity data in clinical trials was informed by the Office of Management and Budget Directive 15. Again, in 2014, FDA issued an action plan to address one of FDA's Safety and Innovation Act, Section 907 requirements, where we recommend medical products applications submitted should improve their demographic subgroup data completeness, quality, and availability. Further, this guidance document in 2014 details three steps in collecting race and ethnicity data. First, self-reporting. Second, ask ethnicity. And third, allow respondents to check all relevant racial categories. The Center for Devices and Radiological Health issued complementary guidance documents that highlights the importance not only of collecting, but also analyzing and reporting information on sex, age, race, and ethnicity in medical device clinical studies. This information may help healthcare providers and patients make informed decisions regarding their care. Again, these guidance documents have been a good first step to help address health equity. Members of the clinical research enterprise allows that certain groups are underrepresented in clinical study cohorts. This was discussed earlier this morning. An underrepresented population refers to a subgroup whose representation is disproportionately low relative to their numbers in the general population or the population of people living in given disease. In an effort to encourage the medical product industry to improve enrollments of these groups, FDA issued a draft guidance recommended diverse plans to proactively work towards including underrepresented race and ethnic groups in trials. CDRE specifically issued a final guidance document leading to our policy on select updates for breakthrough device program. The document indicates that the program may be applicable to certain medical devices that provide for more effective treatment or diagnosis of life-threatening or irreversible debilitating disease or conditions in populations impacted by health or healthcare disparities. The breakthrough program is intended to provide patients and healthcare providers with timely access to medical device by speeding up development, assessment, and review for pre-market approval, 510K clearance, and de novo marketing authorization. As with all things, whenever you hear draft guidance, they're not final or for implementation at this time, but they do illustrate efforts the agency is exploring to help advance health equity. Congress has also underscored the importance of addressing underrepresentation of demographic groups in clinical trials. The first Drug Omnibus Reform Act of 2022 is specifically implemented on the last day of December 2022, also called FEDORA, builds upon the gu draft guidance issued in April of 2022 and will now require the inclusion of diversity action plans for clinical studies across medical products, devices, drugs, and biologics. These diversity action plan will not only be for racial and ethnic minorities, but will also apply for sex and age with consideration of other factors. I wanted to alert you that the agency will be holding a public workshop on enhancing clinical study diversity on November 29th through the 30th of this year, which will further discuss approaches that foster inclusive trials across all medical products. Please plan to arrive as I know that many companies are addressing this particular portion and are interested in diversity in their clinical studies. And we wanted to make sure that all participants within this patient summit are aware of this particular symposium. It is web-based, virtual, and free to all. So let's speak a little bit about CDRH strategic priorities. 
And I can't necessarily start any kind of discussion without really fostering what our mission is here in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Our mission is to protect and promote the public health. And as you see from the highlighted portion, it is also to have safe, effective, and high quality medical devices, have accessible science-based information, and we also want to make sure the medical device information is advanced in regulatory science, providing industry with predictable, consistent, transparent, and efficient regulatory pathway. Our vision within this particular center is patience, and that's intentional for it to be the first word in this sentence. In the United States, have access to high quality, safe and effective medical device of public health importance first in the world. This is not a race for one country to the other, but we want to make sure that we have devices here for the American public to be able to utilize as well as in parallel to other countries. It's important for our consumers, our patients and our caregivers and providers have access to understandable science-based information about our medical devices and use this information to make healthcare decisions. There are three strategic priorities. However, today I will focus on the last strategic priority for the center and note that the actions that I'm going to be discussing are representative and not intended to cover all we intend to do. Our strategic plan goals are public goals. They are not all that we have for ourselves to accomplish. We have intentionally have non-prescriptive to be more innovative in our implementation. And there is a bevy of individuals within and outside the agency that will help us further determine our next steps. So as we speak about our strategic priority in advancing health equity, we want to reduce barriers and increase opportunities as a strategy for participation by diverse populations in evidence generation. This also includes traditional clinical studies as well as getting data from real world data sources. We want to develop a framework for when a device should be evaluated in diverse populations to support marketing authorization. Equally, we want to partner with our patients, healthcare provider, industry, and payers to advance solutions that promote equity along the total product life cycle, including access to care. Our measures for a success, and I'm going to give you an abbreviated version, but by December 31st, 2025, 95% of publicly available pre-market authorization decision summaries issued since December 31st, 2024 will include available data stratified by demographic characteristic. Equally, by the end of 2025, you want to demonstrate year after year improvement from a 2023 baseline measurement of consumer understanding of our patients, caregivers, communication across diverse demographic groups. Giving you a little bit of a window as to the objectives that we have developed for this strategic priority. And the objectives include empowering people with information they need to make informed decisions, facilitating the availability of and access to medical devices, reducing barriers to participation in evidence generation process, and supporting innovation approaches and devices that address healthcare. So let me just give you a little bit more insight regarding some of the things that we have been thinking about as well as doing. First, we want to empower people to have information to make informed decision, to make sure we support empowering people so that they can make the best healthcare decisions for their health and well-being. We're working towards evaluating our messaging, especially in our web pages, so that they're intuitive, user-friendly, and most importantly, understandably. I know that this morning there was discussion about making sure that we meet the needs of our audience, our public, our patients, and that is exactly what we're doing for this particular objective. Secondly, we wanna facilitate availability of medical device novel and non-novel. And in September, 2023, most recently, our center hosted a patient engagement advisory communication where we solicited feedback on the best way to obtain feedback 
on our communication and the best way to meet our patients and caregivers on appropriate and diverse communication tools such as Facebook and TikTok. Identify most important technologies needed to move healthcare outside of the hospital setting, such as clinics and at home. And lastly, evaluate regulatory frameworks to support movement of medical devices from hospital setting to clinics or home use to indicate what diseases will necessitate studying in diverse population. Equally, in early summer, we had an end date of September. The center requested for written comments from the public on home use. We received and are analyzing 123 comments, many of which are multiple pages and have detailed recommendations and challenges for broader medical device community. Central themes and comments are reimbursement, in vitro diagnostics or so laboratory tests, and accessibility needs. Thirdly, we want to support innovation of technologies that address health inequities. And so we wanna address disease areas where there are huge disparities, such as triple negative breast cancer, maternal mortality, and diabetes. Support development of both novel and existing technologies that address important gaps in equity by tools that supports evidence generation, including wearable medical devices. Lastly, to support innovation, we recently updated the breakthrough guidance to clarify consideration and breakthrough eligibility for medical devices that benefit populations impacted by health or healthcare disparities this past September. And then fourthly, in order to reduce barriers to increase participation, we can't report on the safety and effectiveness on a device that we don't know how it performs by evaluating current tr clinical trials diversity data as our baseline. This will be completed by the end of this year. We hope to publish this information next year. And where previous policies have moved the needle, as I've mentioned, the virus guidance document and different activities that we're doing within the center, we will, issue, we will be more ready to better evaluate additional levers. Fostering additional ways to encourage use of digital devices, such as sensors and wearables to collect data outside the clinic, discussing partnerships with other organizations and a patient advocacy group to first train clinical trial investigators at non-clinical traditional research and to better understand the benefit and risk that a patient will be willing to make as it relates to a new or known medical device. All four objectives supports our mission for the strategic priority to advance health equity. And do note, this is a multi-pronged approach to effectuate change. As discussed in my earlier presentation, we had a patient engagement advisory committee meeting that provided a wealth of information that we're working on. Uh, highlighted in this slide shows various accomplishments that we've had. Since April of this year, we also started publishing all safety communication in English and Spanish so that more individuals can access the important information. And we plan to introduce additional languages such as Mandarin and Tagalog in 2024. We opened up a public web page and a section to gather input from stakeholders on home use devices. And as mentioned, we are perusing all of that data so that we could determine next steps. Quite naturally, a lot of information that's being put forward in the docket are pretty straightforward. Some are complicated, but each of which we will communicate to the public as soon as we have analyzed the data. I mentioned already the final breakthrough guidance documents that supports health equity. And then lastly, just want to let you know, internally, we are making changes. We've been working across the agency to support the diversity action plan guidance document. So we'll be coming out with additional information. And this also incorporates when reporting adverse events, and this also can be reported by patients, healthcare providers, and caregiver, giving you the power to be able to address change within the organization. Finally, we've opened a repository to collect information on digital health technologies on home use. And I invite you to provide your input 
as well as we are conducting landscape analysis of our medical devices that have been given marketing authorization. On the next three slides, I will provide a snippet of our clinical study landscape analysis for orthopedic medical devices, as we cannot change what we are completely, until we are completely clear on. So here is the example, and I'm gonna give you highlight excerpts from this. So um, when we did this particular study, we wanted to know and have a baseline information of all of the demographic information that are collected on clinical trials that were given marketing authorization, so either approved or cleared from 1985 to 2020. So that's 35 years of data. Uh, the information that we analyze are public-facing summaries of FDA decisions, and this is available to the public. So we did not use internal data, we use externally-facing information. And the demographics include, but not limited to age, sex, race, and ethnicity. Then we went through the process of double checking all of our raw data collected by two independent team members. And once that is done, we, we provided data analysis. Once all of these unique clinical trials are finalized, we conducted some various analyses to investigate the diversity in terms of sex and race in orthopedic device clinical studies. So this slide provides an example, only an example of some of the data that we've collected. And um, this information provides racial enrollments. Again, 35 years of data. And so all of this information, if you look at the X axis, is a submission years. Y is the percentage of the race in each clinical trial and submission. And the solid circle are the three racial groups, white, black, and Asian percentage in the U.S. population based on the last four census data. From this figure, we can see that white, the light green circles, was the predominant race enrolled in clinical trials and has been steadily high over the past 35 years and higher than the census data. It means the enrollment is about 90%, ranging from 64.8 to 100%. Black, the black circle, is the most commonly enrolled minority. Didn't change much over the past 35 years and, most, and mostly lower than the census data. It mean, the mean enrollment is about 6%. And the rest of each minority groups was only enrolled in 0.2 to 2.0 percentage on average. Key takeaways that we have and in summary for this particular data. And remember, as I mentioned earlier, this is a preliminary analysis. We can see that there's enrollment differences in sex in orthopedic device trials. Specifically, there are significant racial disparities in enrollment with white is predominantly enrolled and all other races are underrepresented. Additional efforts should be taken to enroll underrepresented populations in orthopedic device clinical studies. And I'm sure the data that I've garnered from orthopedics is similar to other data that's garnered from other device specific areas. With that said, I just wanted to end and say CDRH, our center is committed to putting all patients first, which means ensuring that they have access to medical devices to improve their health and quality of life. They have opportunities to contribute to the evidence generation process and they have the information they need to make informed health decisions with their care team. The discussion today were enlightening, and I appreciate the candid discussion and advocacy being your own CEO, and it only highlights much more needs to be done. These discussions and the recommendations from today's meeting will help inform additional steps we can take to ensure everyone has equal opportunity to use medical devices that help them realize the highest attainable level of health. Pending any questions, this concludes my presentation. Thanks to each of you and happy Veterans Day to all who have served. I see there's a question in the chat, so let me go to it. I see there's a push for diversity in clinical trials. Is there something similar to usability human factor testing? That is correct. 
um, not only are we looking for usability in human factor testing, which is typically used for the individuals that are doing the work, but we also want to make sure that diversity in clinical trials represent the United States. And so not only are we looking at policies, but we're looking at ways that we can address those particular change and partner with different organizations, whether it's going to be with patient organization, partner with industry, academia, um, researchers. Um, it is important for us to be able to put forward the push for having more diversity in clinical trials. Um, to answer your question a little bit specifically, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, Early next year, we should be able to finish all of our analysis and be able to publish that sometime in 2024. But that data is going to be, that landscape data is going to be helpful in informing our policies as well as processes that we're doing here within the agency. So stay tuned for more information from us. It's a building block. It's not going to be something that's going to be addressed overnight, uh, but step in stone. I would say usability and human factor testing is one of the many things that need to be addressed. Okay. Thank you so much. It looks as if that's the only question that's posed. I appreciate the time again. And if there are any questions or you feel to provide additional comment, please don't hesitate in contacting me. Hello again. I want to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our wonderful speakers and patients who made time for this event. Thank you. We couldn't have done this without you. Also wish to thank FDA for their commitment to protecting public health and their continued partnership with MDIC. And to all of you who joined us online today, thank you for being part of this impactful event. Special thanks to Dan Stevens and Ali Masood for their guidance in putting together this event. And a big thanks to my colleague, Jonah Golder for his steadfast project management that made it all happen. My heartfelt thanks to Ali, Mary Jo, Amy Mayer, Dr. Del Smith, and my new friend, Dr. Melva Covington, for trusting me with this effort. Thank you. To be candid with you, as, a, as the event organizer, you can imagine concluding a meaningful summit like this comes with a sense of accomplishment. But if you carefully listen to our speakers and patients, it becomes quite evident that we have a lot to do in patient engagement. This responsibility and duty becomes quite clear for all of us and forges an unraveling path forward. We all, you included, have a lot to accomplish yet. This concludes our summit. Thank you. <laughs>